call to order our uh, retreat for today. And um, we have a, uh, a list of items for discussion on our, our memo for this April 15th retreat. And we propose that we reshuffle the order a little bit so that we can talk about items that um, we need Kendra here for, um, being by the district service agreement social media, home rule, and I propose something under the other category, which I think should be a very quick discussion, probably just a statement by Kendra, just uh, in terms of comments to the developer regarding downtown Superior. Uh, just making sure we're all on the same page with how those comments should get to them. Okay. And then the other items. Uh, so the idea of being cover those items uh, between five and six, and then we had, um, and then we cover the remaining items after you, after you sure. depart. Thank you for doing that. Mm-hmm. All right. So with that, we will go ahead and start with the fire district service agreement. And Mark needs to recuse himself. Yep. So I'll let you make your brief statement. Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is, I think, my first recusal with the new board. Um, but just for everybody's information, I work for a law firm, Ireland Stapleton, Prior and Pasco in Denver. Um, we serve as uh, outside general counsel to a number of special districts, one of which is Rocky Mountain uh, Fire District. Um, although I don't work on any of Rocky Mountain Fire District's legal matters as a partner in the law firm, I've got a financial interest, obviously, in my firm. So it has been my policy since getting elected to uh, recuse myself from any and all discussions that the town has involving the fire district and uh, continue that practice today. So. Let me know when you're done. Thank you. We'll do. All right. So the item that we're talking about on the fire district concerns um, fire district service agreement. And Matt, can we go an introduction? To yeah, we had our, our first joint issues committee with them. Um, the district representative, which is Suzanne Devaney and Chief Mike Tombalato talked about a number of things, so a service agreement that we had worked on a couple of years ago um, was one of the topics that was brought up in there. They continue to be very interested in entering into a service agreement with the town. They, they feel like it, it will, most, they, from their perspective, most other districts, fire districts have similar type of agreements with the municipalities they serve. They think it would be beneficial to them, to them and their um, trying to do um, mergers with other fire districts or fire departments to have that security. Um, and they feel like it provides the town with um, assurances as far as level of service and that type of stuff. Um, so I included the draft service agreement we did a couple years ago. The board at that time didn't uh, decided not to enter into a service agreement um, and keep the town's op- options open to do whatever it might be in the future as far as continue as we are with Rocky Mountain Fire or start our own fire department or pursue other fire districts. So that was, um, I think, the main reason for their decision. You were on the board at the time, so. I think there was other others that wanted some commitment on the part of Rocky Mountain to reduce the mill levy or, or somehow provide some cost relief and that was just kind of a non-starter for them and it was kind of a non-starter to come off of that position for some of the board and so we just kind of got to this stalemate of of not not moving forward on it Um, i think it's a good idea to have it i personally don't have any interest in pursuing another pursuing our own fire department uh, pursuing um, partnership with any other district and um, so with that i think it makes sense to have one and uh, yeah so i think that's kind of why it's why it's back here we have a new board and, and maybe there's a new um, could be a new interest in in having one so i have a basic question with the and how the iga works so part of superior is covered by louisville fire department the downtown area just by virtue of right. the carve out does that portion have an iga with louisville no so if superior energy it would be our idea with louisville as the governing body okay so even though it's only a portion of the town it would have to be our idea with louisville i see okay. and we don't okay 
so do we create a conflict if part of the town is under an IGA with RMF and part of the town is not covered by an IGA, a reciprocal IGA with Louisville? Uh, I don't think so, but I know we haven't really. Well, and, uh, I, this plays into it, I think, a little bit, but Rocky Mountain Fire has a operating agreement with Louisville right. Fire District, okay. okay. so. It's they, they do, yes, okay. but no, it doesn't. And, you know, um, we don't have to have an agreement with either of them. We can have agreement with both of them. Okay. Um, so, it, but it doesn't matter that we only had an agreement with one or the other. Yeah. They have an agreement with each other. Okay. This would limit, though, any annexation to the town has to go into this district. Correct. Mm -hmm. no. While the agreement's in place. Right. Exactly. The properties left to be annexed are Old Jack to the south and the 76th Street properties and the small Stewart property. Very limited. Is Rocky Mountain Fire willing to include those if we were to annex them? They don't have any choice. No, <laughs> okay. Yes. Just, just making sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, if anyone recalls the election, I have, I have just a problem with the cost structure, and that you know, I think we've seen. And, and even within the draft agreement, there's an aspect here in Appendix A where if it's signed, they're going to move um, the district office administration office of all to the superior facility. It's not clear to me how that gets paid for, because um, you know, it's all out at uh, the canyon, over on the canyon right now. So if all that gets moved here, is this sufficiently large enough fire station? So that obviously that was the 2016 agreement, and that is null and void, and we'd have a new agreement. But I think. When I looked at this over the election period, our master structure relative to our surrounding communities is significantly higher. Um, it's by nature of the, the real estate that they cover, the thinly populated areas that they cover outside of Superior. You know, we're a large part of their population density, but a very small part of the geography. Um, I, mean, I definitely feel for our map. It's, it's a difficult position that Boulder County has put them into. I don't know that, I don't know how to fix it. I don't, I'm a little leery of entering into an IGA with, without a path to fixing the economics. So, I'll, yeah, I'll weigh in. But I think I'm not unsupportive of an, of an IGA in general. Um, I think the IGA that we did a few years ago um, was fixing a problem from a few years ago. Frankly, that problem's got a little bit worse, right? Because the, there's been some additional redistricting amongst the fire districts. Yeah. Times have changed. They're doing this, um, I don't know what it's referred to, but I'll call it a pilot program with Lafayette Fire. Um, I went through a lot of different meeting minutes uh, between the fire districts trying to find where it was an actual barrier brought up in, a me in any meeting minutes through Rocky Mountain Fire or anywhere else that the fact that they did not have a service agreement with Superior was um, any kind of block. And while we've heard the chief and, and Suzanne and members of the board express that. Um, I, I think there's a lot of issues that need to be resolved. We need to improve the relationship between the town and Rocky Mountain Fire. And we've had a meeting, and this came up in that meeting. I think it's premature to consider a service agreement at this point, considering a service agreement at this point. So I, I personally am not interested in okay. pursuing and I didn't spend a lot of time reading the service agreement because I, I sort of figure the concept is that we want to, are we supportive of a service agreement? And if so, we should obviously resurrect the old one and try to use it what we can, you know. But for me, I, I, it's just premature. I think we need to have a few meetings. I think we need to see how our pilot program goes with Lafayette and see directionally where, where we're going. And, you know, if we're trending in a direction where uh, it's getting more expensive to our residents and we're seeing service levels decrease or we're seeing their training being cannibalized which was um, what they were worried about then I think we need to then Clint you know like you I'm not interested in pursuing other options at this point but if things get worse you know, then I think we may as a board need to look at other options. But right now, you know, I have no reason to believe things are going to get worse. I'm hopeful things are going to get better. But for now, I don't think the service agreement is the fix. Okay. And, all right. 
Lake Neal, <clears throat> I'm more concerned about the, the commercial aspect of things. We just went under contract with the economic developer. One of the things I'm looking for when I meet with them this week, I'm going to talk about, I want to see some type of analysis compared to tax burdens across the area. And let's start to quantify, okay, if our tax burden with Rock Mountain Fire is truly a, an inhibitor to building businesses in Superior, let's start to get some numbers to it and find out what our goal is and start to work towards that goal with Rocky Mountain. But we don't know the answer to that question yet. And that's what I, that's a piece I'm looking for before we go down the road of another agreement. Okay. All right. I agree with everything that okay. Scott has said. All right. What I'm, I'm hearing is we're not too far off where we were in the past. Let's continue the uh, board engagement with their board and continue the dialogue and, and maybe it's something to revisit. Right. I mean, I, I just want, it's not where we were a few years ago. It's a trending much better as an approved relationship. Yeah. So let's just, you know, be a little Keep that going. cautious around that characterization. Good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Mark. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Only because I want another one of those trying to cover presents. <laughs> sure All right. Next, um, I would <coughs> propose that we talk um, yep. real quickly about sending feedback comments from the board to developer downtown superior sure yeah they should not go to the board <laughs> they should go to well, well, so from the board to the the, the, the question was <clears throat> if board members have comments for the developer uh -huh. they, they should go to the <coughs> staff or to the developer in a public forum like a work session like that, but a subset of the board or individual board members going to the developer to provide comments on on that is not an option. Correct. 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 Okay. And so I think that was where we may have made a misstep in our last meeting. We had invited the public to email the board their feedback. So we'll yeah put on the record that they should be emailing MassM at Superior Colorado. Yeah. Gov, not Town Board at Superior yes. Colorado. Yes. That's, that's still not going to prevent. Residents from emailing the board. Of course, I understand yeah. that, okay. but I just don't want to encourage that as the preferred method of communication. That's, yeah. I understand that you're going to get comments. On that. And, cool. and then, Clint, to your further point, and um, if we have additional feedback, though, what is the best mechanism? Is it for us to send that to Matt and Matt to pass it along? So I'm a little, so I'm a little behind on why. We, so we had the concept of presentation. Where is the additional feedback coming from? I mean, residents. This, so what? residents talking to you, and then you turning that around I'm, no 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 i'm okay. sorry i meant it as our additional feedback that they have additional feedback in the developer that should happen in a public meeting okay so that's that's why i'm a little concerned okay so because normally you you react then and yep. then you give them all your feedback you do but you also think of things sure, after exactly. the fact and you know somebody might say something to you that didn't, oh yeah i hadn't thought of that, that okay that kind of thing so yeah. okay um <clears throat> Yeah, probably the best thing to do is then to, to email staff and then maybe staff can compile all that and send it to the developer rather than having direct communications with the developer. That's from the Great. Plan. Okay, thank you. In, in terms of the communications that, that we've received thus far, we've got a handful of emails. Um, Matt, you have access to all of those. Yeah. Are you just forward them on to yeah. the developer? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. That covers that. Idea. Let's talk about home rule. Okay. Uh, so we had the discussion at the December retreat, and it was my, I, I had thought that the kind of general consensus was that not to move forward with home rule at this time, but after talking to some board members, they wanted to talk about it and get some additional information from staff. Kendra and I discussed this, racked our brains trying to come up with other information with. or examples that we haven't, you know, already provided in the staff memo and didn't I have, really I have one during the hearing on Thursday, the judge said we might be able to do this if we were home rule. I don't know where he was going with that. The judge hated us so it really didn't matter. But um, kind of gross of salt in your yeah, wood. Exactly. Well if you were home rule, you're not even home rule came out in the middle of the hearing. No. You're not even home rule. I Again, we, we have more land use authority, but I can't point to anything specific that would have been better for Land Rover if we were home rule, unless we gave ourselves explicit authority in our charter to regulate by user, which was what the judge was so offended by. 
And then we have these self-collection of sales tax receipts. That's, the, stuff, that's the biggest one. Yeah. Taxes are the, that's the biggest one. And, and one, of, one of the things that we could do if we were on roll would, would be to pass like a pollution tax. Like so, like okay. say like in, in connection with the whole drafting of ordinances in response to SB 181, one of which could be uh, there's going to be you know, some sort of environmental impact tax that we're going to levy on oil and gas development. Or any industrial. Whatever, yeah. And, you know, as, as, a, as a means of kind of defraying, you know, the environmental costs to the town or things like that. Um, so that's that's one additional thing that we wouldn't be able to do unless sure. we are comfortable. Yeah. Kendra, can you uh, jump back to the land use pieces a bit? Um, you mentioned Land River as the example. If we said single you or single, what was it? I, I don't even know if this would be upheld. The judge was not happy that we had the words Land Rover in that agreement. Okay. So as, as the judge said, you, zoning regulates uses, not users. The, the agreement's invalid. So getting to the more broader context then, the land use powers that we would get that we don't currently have, mm -hmm. can you give us an example of where that would truly be beneficial? I'll have to look back at this. I don't, I think we listed everyone I, I can think of. I was going to say, is there? <laughs> I don't think there's, Matt and I have been doing this for how many years have we been talking about the wall? And every time Early it comes up, we try to think of better or more examples. And I think we've, we've pretty much covered it. There's, there's not much else I can say. Um, other than what's in here already. So I was supposed to be just a little confused. So like for land use, you're at the bullet says have greater control over zoning issues, including restriction of or elimination of uh, non conforming uses, permitting sign codes and basic right. uh, district regulations. So an example of the elimination of non conforming uses. Make sure I'm picturing what that means appropriately. So there's a statute that governs non conforming uses, mm -hmm. which is what the judge relied on on Thursday. Um, that says we are not allowed to, well, depends how you read the statute. He read it as we are not allowed to terminate non-conforming uses because the statute says we can't. Arguably, if we had an ordinance and we were home rule, we wouldn't have to follow that statute. Okay. Um, so I, I disagree with the judge's interpretation of the statute in the first place because what the statute says is you can't amortize non-conforming uses. But what the judge found is amortize means it's the same as terminate. So because we tried to rezone the property, and because the judge found it was a legal non-conforming use when it was the Denver collection, um, that we weren't allowed to terminate it by the rezoning. So, uh, but the argument is that's a statute in Title 29 that wouldn't apply to us if we were home rule and we had our own authority to regulate non-conforming uses. Okay. <clears throat> Specific questions about uh, the actual process. Um, mm -hmm. Once the, uh, the Home Rule Commission gets established uh, and they send their recommendation, the charter, up to the board, mm -hmm. uh, does the board have the authority to make changes to that? No. What is, a, what is the board's role? Simply to send it to an election. Do they have a choice okay. not to send it to an election? That's a good question. I thought they did. They do, because you already did if that. If it's a bad Cause charter. Yeah, because you already got the provision that required people to own a gun. And then <laughs> Or decided not not to send it. That was the last time. Um, so, yeah. so I'm trying to understand. This is more kind of a uh, it works in parallel to the board, not underneath the board in any way. Exactly. And it's make relatively independent. And make up of the commission. Who can be on that? Could it be board members? Could it be planning commissioners? Could it be committee members? It can be not board members. I don't think. Hold on, I'm looking. They are elected. They're elected, and I don't believe it can be board members. But I have to, I'm going to have to check on that. I haven't looked at this story in a while. Right. Um, but right. uh, they, they are elected. So there's because the first election is to form the charter commission, right. and then the names go on the actual ballot who wants to be on the charter commission, which they do by petition. My my read on this is we have just not reached more than about a or three or five, two, maybe threshold of, of board support for this in over the years. It's it was very compelling to me to hear what other cities and towns have done with respect to <coughs> sales tax collection. So that was for me enough of a reason and the and the most prevalent reason to pursue home rule. 
I, I think if we if we were starting today in Superior and said, how do we want to set up sales tax collection? We would never, ever do it like it's being done now. And so now we have an opportunity to, and have, the town has had an opportunity to change that via home rule. So we either say, eh, too much trouble, not going to mess with it, or, or we pursue it. And I continue to believe it's worth pursuing because we are we are leaving money on the table. Money is leaking out to we don't even know where because that's part of the process is figuring that out. So, but I also recognize um, that we need unanimous board support to pursue this because absent that, we're not going to get there. And. And so I, I very much recognize the concerns of other board members and, and uh, don't think this is, this is not something we should undertake uh, lightly or with, or with thin support. Uh, we've got way too much other stuff going on and we need to stay focused on those things that we uh, can get accomplished. And uh, at such time that there's, um, majority, very strong majority, and I would say unanimous support of, among the board to pursue it, then we pursue it. Otherwise, let's just um, maybe keep talking about it, but I, I don't really think we ought to even spend a lot of time on it if, if there's not that willingness to, to move forward. And just to, to, not to interrupt, but I was incorrect. It, trustees can be elected to the charter portion, oh. but it is an elected. It's any registered elector, so I, I just never seen that happen, but it can one of the reasons that was uh, you know, compelling um, when we were originally talking about this in the last board um, was the notion of we weren't collecting any sales tax remittances from Amazon. And so at that point in time, the discussion was if we were home rule, we'd be able to do that. And Matt, Martin, and Paul were instrumental in actually solving that problem. So. That was kind of one of the, the main kind of motivator exactly. factors. Like, that's got to be a huge amount. Of, I mean, everybody buys everything on, on, on Amazon these days. So, if we were leaving that on the table, um, you know, that to me was like a pretty compelling, motivating you know, reason behind going home roll. But we were able to, to solve that without going home roll. So, I think that that was, that was great uh, that staff was able to, to uh, solve that problem. I'd like to know, I agree with, with Clint. You know, I think we, we, we need to be unanimous on this. Um, I don't know if I'm there yet. It's, it's certainly not, you know, like a compelling, absolutely yes, we need to, to do this right now. I'd, I'd be interested in hearing from Kendra and also from Matt Sura with respect to Senate Bill 181 after it gets signed tomorrow. Um, how, how differently can we regulate, if at all? And if, if there's if there's something we can do, I mean, with respect to like the pollution taxes, impact mm -hmm. taxes, things like that, mm -hmm. um, that would be you know one possibility. But there's also kind of a framework for imposing fees, and fees and taxes are different under uh, you know the Constitution, Colorado Constitution, and Colorado State Law. So um, if it's not necessarily a uh, um, a real significant difference between you know impact fees and, and pollution taxes, then maybe it's not necessarily worth it. Uh, to, to go home roll, but I kind of defer to council's recommendation as to whether or not they think that it's something that we should really you know, get behind. Um, I, I, I do think, though, uh, you know, right now, because we're relying on the state to do the auditing of the sales tax, I think, and this is purely like speculation on my part, and I'll admit that, um, but I would imagine that if we did go home roll and we had the ability to do these audits ourselves, we would be surprised at how much money we were yeah, you're leaving a ton of money on the table. Like in the six figures. Yep, easily. So, you know, and that to me seems like we're being not necessarily good fiscal stewards of the town's finances if we're allowing that kind of, you know, uh, leakage from you know, what our collections are. So, you know, to that end, we have, as you mentioned, the, the Amazon collection maybe think you know the other reason that we headed down this path uh, many years ago was to tr change the election date 
and we figured out we could do that without going to home rule. And we figured out we could collect the Amazon tax without going to home rule. I'm wondering, you know, is, is there a way that we can pay for audits? Okay, no. <laughs> We've like, tried. Sorry. Okay. All right. No. The state says absolutely not. Okay. So, basically what the state says, if you're going to make us do it, we do it. I will say I'm, I'm supportive of us moving to home rule primarily because of the financial impact. I mean, when you look at the one time cost, $25,000, but then we're looking at potentially bringing in 100,000 a year easily from just that sales tax collection, that's, that's a big difference. Um, I do understand that there's the potential of having a bad charter. Um, I, I would be supportive of going home rule and trying to limit our charter to the, the issues where we truly feel that we should differ from what the state policy is. Um, that said, Clint, I would disagree with one thing that you mentioned around, um, you know, it's a busy year for us. I think I think every year is going to be a busy year. There's always going to be something coming down the line. So I would just urge the rest of the board not to look at it as we've got a lot going right now or we'll keep kicking the can down the road for 10 years. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. I, I, I would not say not to do it. I, yep. <laughs> I, it's more, for me, it's more about we need to have everybody on board. Agreed. Uh, and, and you know, I think the one thing I'll add to what Laura said is, you know, there's a budget, and there's a cash component of it, but getting people out to vote for this thing is going to be the most heavy lift. You know, beyond the unanimous support, we're going to have to encourage people to vote. So Castle Pines just went through this in November. 10,000 residents in their town, they had 62% vote for it, you know, the 5,000 that voted. So it's very, you know, similar to us. You know, who's going to be out there encouraging everyone to vote for this? You know, you know, if we're only talking about the financials, that's a tough one. I wish we had more that we could point to around why we should do this. I'm, I'm wondering if legally, Kendra, feel free to weigh in on this. Um, can we do, I mean, can we do kind of a marketing campaign where we're, yeah, that's, no. No. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'm just going to say no today. That's where, that's where unanimous support of the board exactly. comes in. So if, yeah. if there's unanimous support of the board, then that, that, this is the body the public is elected to dive deep into this stuff and but if, if the public seeing, wait a minute, they're not all even on board. Why? How can we be on board? Mm -hmm. It's doomed. Mm -hmm. And there, there can be a, a political committee to do what you just said. It can't be part of the town. I see. But if you have residents who are highly supportive of this, they can certainly form a committee, and you know it'll be subject to the Fair Campaign, Campaign Practices Act. Sure. But, but they can certainly do that. So, and that's what often happens, and that's what happened in Castle Pine. Right. Castle Pines. So. If you have some residents who are passionate about this and willing to take that on as a job, yes, definitely, there could be a marketing campaign. It just can't come from you. It can't sure. come from this building. Sure. So, but it certainly can be done. Because I, I mean, I think something along those lines, especially as we are looking to the future of downtown Superior, it's it's something that's a hot topic. At the sure. Yeah, you get Louisville to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> they saw a million dollars their first year. Yeah. Now, not every year, but. So that was in 1996. Yeah. Well, it brings compliance. You know, I mean, yeah. the audits bring compliance. Right. So the numbers go down over the years, but the right. first year is usually huge. Yeah. 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 Others? I mean, I, I'm just, I'm not convinced at this point. And, you know, I, it, I do think it's going to be a lot of work. <clears throat> and I guess, you know, kind of here and what happened in Castle Pines, it sounds like there was citizenry who really wanted to see this happen right. and for me it feels like this is a continuing discussion that we have as a board and we've kicked this little sucker for three years now since i've been on the board and i'm just i don't louisville is very different than we are as far as the businesses that are there we got you know pretty much six or seven that we're relying on for most of our sales tax revenue. So I just don't know whether at this point I'm sold. You know, we don't have the number of small businesses, for example, that Louisville does. And so I just, I'm not, I'm not there yet. Um, you know, but I, I guess I, if I was hearing from our citizens that this was the thing they wanted us to do more than anything else, um, but I'm just not there yet. I mean, I don't, the fact that I specifically wanted to say, what are what are the things that would have made a difference for us? 
and, and yet we can't come up with five or six things. Um, the money, yeah, I think we think we might get it, but we don't know. And so I'm just not, I'm not there yet. Matt, so. in the memo, you had um, said that typically municipalities increase receipts by at least one percent annually. Um, do we have any picture of kind of what the lows and highs are of that to address Sandy's point? I mean, we are we are different than Louisville, but my assumption is that when you're saying by at least one percent annually, that means we're pretty sure we'll get at least a hundred thousand from. Right. Okay. I mean, to me, that's to me that's very compelling. Twenty-five thousand dollar investment. 10,000 of audits a year to get 100,000 a year. I mean, if, if it were my money, I would do that. It, the other thing we could do is we could get back in touch with the town of Hudson to see what, they, he came in, right, that one time and talked, and it, maybe they have more figures on what, because that's a tiny town, so, you know, I don't know what their sales, sales tax figures are, but that might give you the other, I mean, if Louisville is a million dollars the first year, Hudson has four businesses, perhaps, maybe five, so, you know, you might get the other spectrum, but at least it'll give you a percentage. I can certainly, you know, see if I can get that information for you, or at least have, if you want to hear from them again. I mean, I also think the online component is important. Yes, we, maybe we're only looking at six businesses in Superior, but we know a large percentage of the town shops online. I can say I'm probably a big portion of that right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, to Paul's credit and staff's credit, Matt and Martin, I'm forgetting that. That was huge. If this discussion did nothing other than to get that going, I mean, that alone was, was huge. So. Yeah, and from my perspective, if the 100000 wasn't there because we already got it by virtue of you know, chasing after Amazon, would we still do this? You know, if there's literally 0.1% you know, of yeah. tax availability, and this is the unknown, like, we don't know. We've got, we still have a lot of cash registers in this town doing a lot of business, and that's just not being audited. That's that's the concern. I mean, online is a piece of it, and a big piece, and an increasing piece. But we've got a lot of registers and not a lot of retailers, and it's between them and the state. Can we can we maybe reach out to the CML to the municipal league and just see if they have any additional resources or data specifically to to Laura's point, like in terms of you know what. what typical returns are you know obviously we've got Louisville's information but you know every town is different and, and unique so yeah I think it would be great to, to talk to the town of Hudson and see what their experience is but I mean if we could get more data I mean if this if this stuff is yeah. available and uh, there, there's a hundred cities and towns that have done this yeah. and um, yeah I've had I've, I've, I've conversations to see all about this the, the real the real data comes individually from the different cities because their finance people are doing their own thing. I don't know to what degree CML has aggregated all that, so it's kind of uh, a little bit of going to each one. But Centennial was another one that, um, similar in size to us, and similar in retail, you know, very heavy in retail, um, a lot more um, than us, but still very retail heavy. And, blown away by how much they got from yeah. switching. I mean, it just seems like if, if we could, if there is this potential windfall out there, I mean, that could pay for new parks, that could pay for, you know, new snow plows, well, it, for, like a lots, lots of things that, you know, we otherwise even, are. Even if it, it, it's just, it's like walking by money on the street, yeah. right? to me. It's, yeah. it's just like, I'm too busy to pick that hundred up, you know, I gotta keep going. For me, it's not an issue of we're too busy. It's that I want, instead of anecdotal information, I want something, even if Matt talks to six cities and they say, all right, we don't really want to give you the exact figures. You know, we don't want to make it public. And, you know, there's some way we can get some firm figures. Okay, the city of Centennial increased its revenue from a million dollars to a million one or a million dollars to a million five. I mean, it's not $25,000 we're investing here to do this. It's 50 grand. You know, if we look at the staff memo, it's it's not an 
an inconsequential amount of money. But if I had some specific answers instead of, I talked to Ken and Ken said this kind of thing, I want some firm numbers sitting in front of me instead of anecdotal. And I'm not yeah. disbelieving no, what and, you're saying. And Centennial gave us those numbers. You know. It's not a matter of they won't give us, they, they will give us they will, numbers. Yeah, they'll and give us. we got them for the last presentation. So I mean, we've, we can aggregate all of this. I mean, it's, but it's, same story. Yeah. So for me, the, the missing piece right now, and, and the financial piece is very compelling. It clearly is a no-brainer if we're only looking at financials. The piece that I'm missing is we have heard literally nothing from the public pushing for this, at least that I've seen. And when I did put this on social media, the only thing that I got back when we talked about it last retreat was people saying, why the heck are you guys talking about wasting time going this way? So there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it can do. Before we would actually go down this route, my preference would to be actually, actually do some public outreach. I mean, we've done it on all types of things, uh, the, the rec center. I mean, I, I would like to see, A, do people care about this and want to do it? B, I'd like to actually establish what people want to see in that charter. That way they actually start to get some ideas about it, I mean, up front. I mean, that way, if we do go down this route, we already know, A, yes, our citizens are somewhat behind this, but B, we also already have a little bit of groundwork laid for them to pick up and run with. I mean, my, my biggest concern is a bad charter. I mean, Laura, I think you said it, mm -hmm. let's try to limit it to the big things. We can't limit it. it if whatever that charter commission comes up with, we come up with. Well, yeah. true, but there's a template charter that CML has. The best charter just literally takes the template and makes very few, because what you want a charter to be is to give all the power that you're entitled to without limiting it and not being overly specific because and, that's when you get into problems. And if we can get that, that's perfect. But mm -hmm. the risk is, I don't know who's going to end up on that commission. Right, and understood. People are electing us to make sure our town continues to go, up, to go down the right path. If people get on that commission and we get something silly in the charter, but it still passes, all of a sudden we've relinquished where we were at and may have set ourselves back in other ways rather than just financially, which we clearly would go forward on. I mean, there's risks there, and I want to try to minimize those risks through public outreach before we actually jump jump on the bandwagon. I think this is a yawn for most people because <laughs> you're, you're, it's, you're hard, all right. it's hard yeah. to understand. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand what the benefits are. Mm -hmm. And the reaction I get is, this is why we elect you guys to read all this stuff yeah. and wade it, through all this stuff and figure this stuff out. So you figure it out. If you're good with it, I'm good with it. I mean, yeah. that's kind of the... Yeah. So I'm not worried about bad charter. I think we've got a lot of smart people in this town, mm -hmm. and, and I think we, I, we would... You know, we can figure that out. I mean, or the commission can figure that out. It, it's a question of can we convince ourselves, this body, mm -hmm. that sends this to the uh, to the uh, uh, electorate to get to get this going? Do we believe in it? Mm -hmm. Do we believe in it? I well, really think. Sorry, that's about, uh, sorry, I was trying to unpack like it from the last meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that's a really good way to summarize it, because I think I'm, I'm sold on, a, on the benefit to the town. I'm just worried about the execution. You know, Castle Pines, you know, since the election in November, they've had, their charter commissions had 10 meetings, three hours a pop, 30 hours that these folks have been working on a template. Um, it's a heavy lift for whoever it is that wants to be on this commission to get it done. And unless we've got an idea of who wants to be on that commission or who's intrigued to be on that commission, excluding you know, us, a little leery to just kind of throw this out there because it is going to be a you know hey board we're unanimous you know, behind this we want to go find people in the community that really want to do this and be passionate about it and drive it to home because it is going to take some you know, pushing and prodding to get it done yeah. which you know I don't I don't know like I can't think of 15 people that want to do this Castle Pine somehow gets like 15 yeah. um, we well, might struggle to get nine. So I mean I would I would say you know it's, it, it will probably be similar people to those who want to become trustees. Um, you know, it's something where if you describe the job and you say, oh, you know, it's reading hundreds of pages of material and attending all these meetings and you don't really get paid for it, everyone's like, well, why would you want to do that? Um, and yet, here we all are very passionate about it. So I, I think if we did put it out to the community, we would find people yeah. who are interested. I'm not sure I have anything else to add with the exception of, I think of where a lot of people are, you know, once there is a demand from the community that I'd be a little bit more, or maybe that demands some sort of interest, or, <laughs> or, you know, just 
somebody that has raised their hand or, or taken any interest and in, got any. I will say that I'm, you know, we are not Louisville, Centennial. I'm just not quite there on the number of cash registers that are somehow shorting the town on our receipts. I, I'm not as bullish around the fact there's going to be a hundred thousand dollars found. It'd be great if it was. Obviously, if there's a guaranteed hundred thousand, it's an easy decision. And we make some calls and we try to drum up some interest and have that campaign. But the bottom line is, we don't know. It may be nothing, right? And it could. It, yeah. it, I'm not saying that it will be or it likely would be nothing, but. You know, we have some big retailers here. There's those big retailers are likely getting it right. Now those receipts might be going to the wrong municipality. And so we may help identify that the receipts are being sent to the wrong municipality. But similarly, some of those it may flip the other way as well. There may be receipts that are coming our way. So I'm just not, and I'm not suggesting I have any evidence that there is. I'm just, when somebody says, you know, oh, you're walking by the street and, you know, it's like not picking up the money. I, I'm just not quite there. there. The money, if we had any concrete evidence that the money was on the street, then I, I'd be all for it. So of so 100 municipalities that have done this, if, if, we can, if we can look at all of those and say, guess what? None of them have seen zero. None of them have seen negative. They've all seen positive something ranging from you know, half a percent to whatever. Is that compelling for me? So is that yeah, this isn't the only, so I agree with things that people said. You know, my primary thing is, you know, I really appreciate what Laura said because if we kick the can, like, okay, this isn't a priority, but if you kick the can, it's never gonna be the priority. So at some point you have to sort of say, okay, we're gonna make it a priority. I think that's a compelling reason for me, and I sort of think maybe not this year, maybe next year, who knows. I think the, the absence of community involvement, the worry about uh, getting the wrong charter, these are all things that why I'm not 100% behind it. My additional thing is I'm not as bullish around the receipts that the audit is going to reveal this giant influx of, of cash. I'm just a little skeptical around that. Now, just because we're not, you know, I, I just don't think, you know, we can count the stores we have. You know, we don't have that many, as you said, I would use the same phrase, cash registers in the community. And I'm not sure that, you know, taking those small businesses and saying, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna audit you because we think that the, you know, $4,000 that you gave to the town last year should have been, you know, 5,200. It's just this not. isn't about the small ones. Okay. This then. is about this is about the five or six businesses that generate you know seventy five percent of revenue. So if this is about the five or six, then I'm then I'm yeah. very skeptical that there is somehow, and that's where I just don't buy that those five or six, and we can name them, are yeah. somehow not doing this right and magic not magically, but there will be an audit that's going to generate many more funds. I just, I, again, no evidence. It's just, if we bank this on, we're doing this because it's $100,000, and then we spend all the time, and we make the priority, and we engage the community, and we don't pick up $100,000, that's unfortunate. So I just want to make sure that we, so, we look at all the ideas. Yeah. So let's do this. Those that are interested in, in uh, uh, continuing to pursue this, I, I think it is a, a worthy exercise to dig a little deeper on these communities, these hundred communities that have done this, and try to find, you know, to try to write the, the narrative a little bit better. And maybe we bring this back in six months or a year or something like that. And, and uh, But I, I think at this, from this meeting, I think that's the best. I mean, we can either do nothing or we can do, uh, you know, we can continue to kind of information gather and educate <clears throat> ourselves. And, maybe convince ourselves to go a different direction or maybe convince ourselves yeah, to do Yeah, and anything. I have no problem with it. There's there's a number of topics we talk about and I think we talk about too much and I get upset and say I don't want to talk yeah. about that for a year. Yeah. Um, this is not one. Okay. I, I think this is a really important topic and I agree that the community has elected us to consider the really important things and this is really important so we need to talk about this 
yeah. at the next retreat or the retreat. I'm fine talking about this and okay. making the right decision. This isn't split joining committees yeah. and we just talked about it. This is yeah. something we I, This is never something we will hear from the community. You guys need to do this. But I think what they do say is you guys need to spend our money wisely, you need to make good decisions, you need to do good things. And I think this absolutely falls in that category of, of all of those things. So let's, those that would like to continue, I don't think what this is not, you know, maybe staff can do a little deep dive, or <laughs> deep dive on this, but I think individually we can, you know, we, we have a lot of smart uh, heads on this board that can, can kind of individually dive deeper on this to uh, try to fill in some of these blanks and let's do that and uh, can we put it officially on to the first quarter retreat of next year when we're talking about board goals and that sort of thing and that seems like the appropriate time to kick it back off again i, I would prefer to see it sooner than yeah. that sure. possible yeah, i'd like to see it at the next retreat be, because of if you decide oh, to move timing. forward then right. you yeah. have that full year to yep. do right. the election right. cycle and form a charter and then have it ready for november and so one important thing around retreat. one important thing around timing and when kevin mentioned this i mean i think we just heard a concept plan this week um, for development of more retail obviously that application has not gone through yet we don't know what will happen but this is a long process i would i would really like to see us go through it sooner rather than later that's why supposed to be painful too <laughs> yeah that's right not optimistic about the retail I mean, it's a fair point, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Good discussion. All right. In the remaining ten minutes, if mm -hmm. there's time with us, we'll talk about uh, social media policy. So, <laughs> I don't know where you want to start with this. Since our last discussion, there's been a lot of back and forth with, among you all, and I just I'm, I don't know if you want me to address something specific about this or how you want to proceed. One question I mean, that I had was about this whole Facebook profile thing and um, the, you know, the creating a new person to be our, and, and Neil's has done this. Mm -hmm. Two people now. Two people have done this. <laughs> right. And then Ken found where the page can now comment. Can comment. Now okay. comment That's good. And which kind of lends itself to being. Which, which is weird though, because I found that not all groups allow your page to comment mm -hmm. okay. it's, it's up to them I mean, right they have to opt so in. so for instance the superior community facebook page i can comment as my page trustee okay for the 0027 i have not been able to figure out how to comment as my page got it maybe because it's closed and you're not oh, a I no no i am a member i am your page a member yeah, your page has to sign up as a Yeah, your page has to be a member. Were you able to do it? I believe so. Now I want to double okay. check I went, that. I was trying to figure it out, and I tried to sign up as my page, and I was unable to, so I assumed there's a setting issue. I think they have to. Yeah, I couldn't um, do it either. They I tried, have to. I could not figure Maybe it out. Maybe I'm mistaken. I'll check right now. Okay. So the question is, for those <laughs> like myself who procrastinated um, right. creating another person right. on, on Facebook, is that... Is that sufficient to operate as a oh. page that can comment? Yes, it seems like it. I, again, okay. I'm not a Facebook expert, so yeah. we've got to take this with a bit of a grain of salt. But yes, from what I understand you to be telling me, yes, that works. Okay. But yes. the issue, so the issue is, so the public is clear on who is commenting. Is it exactly. Clint, is it Clint the individual right. or Clint the mayor? If that's what is, if this can accomplish that, that exactly, that's the goal. Okay. That, yep. Good. Yep. Fascination pigs. I just needed to wait like two days. So, yeah, you just missed it. <laughs> Kendra, along those down. lines, I have had residents that tag me, and I've seen them tag other people as well, where they are tagging me personally and saying, Laura Squajinski, what do you think of this? Okay. I have, ch I have not responded essentially and tried to keep it separate in that way. Is that acceptable, or that's fine? Is there any other way to handle that? I think you can untag yourself. Okay. I mean, I'm just saying, you don't have to, someone can tag me and I don't have to accept sure. it. Sure. So okay. That's what I would do. Okay. We'll do that one. Okay. Is the goal here that we review the policy and then ultimately just adopt it as a board? That would be my goal. I mean, that's, that would be my goal. From a liability perspective, I, that would be my suggestion, that eventually we adopt this policy. We can certainly talk about changes to the policy if you all have changes that you'd like to see. A, a policy is important so that we're all following the same rules. That's the most important thing. So the, the other 
Is there anything else on the Facebook side? Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I like the policy. I mean, I get a little confused when we get to you know, re-election time and Facebook pages and you That's know, gonna trustee, be tough. Yeah. trustee created pages versus other, I mean, we're going to have like eight pages. I know. Um, it's a pain. Right. And, which I have no problem with. I just mm -hmm. want everybody to understand that there's policy is fairly prescriptive in terms of the separation between you know devices. You can't even use this device mm -hmm. on your yes. re-election Facebook page. Mm -hmm. So as long as we're all aware of that. And that's even beyond the policy. You can't use a town device for your election because that's public money. Oh, sorry. Right. So yeah, yeah. I mean, so that arguably. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. you don't want to go overboard. But yes, if no, you're using I, a town iPad for your own election. Yeah, no, but look, yeah. with Facebook's ubiquity and the fact that you've got your own individual account, mm -hmm. and then you've got these sub-pages that you're, are basically your trustee identity. Right. If you access that via this device, Erroneously, I mean, effectively, the violation of policy and state law. True, but hopefully, I mean, again, I know it's, to miss this yeah, kind of, enough, you know, or, oops, I opened my Facebook page yeah. and I was on my iPad and I forgot. It's not going to be a problem. Right. So, so one kind of wrinkle in all this, um, one of the concerns that I had with this this policy. So, you know, I've got my personal Facebook account and I've got a, you know, Mark Lace's Superior Trustee uh, page, which now that we can comment on these groups. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing that, you know, commenting as, you know, my trustee page. I tried to create a, you know, a separate account, and I apparently my, my name has been used to create other accounts. So like Facebook wouldn't let me create a new account, and it was like flagged for fraud. And then I, I found out that there was a number of different accounts within Facebook using my name and using kind of variations of my name. So I don't know. If somehow I've been flagged for fraud or something like that, you know, within Facebook. So it was just like actually impossible for me to comply with this policy. So that's one of my concerns. Like I don't want sure. us to adopt a policy that And maybe we, we can maybe we, we need can. to put an exception in. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, so, I mean like, what I would like to, to do what I would like to do is just kind of operate using my page and now that I can comment just kind of have that be sufficient under this policy and you know I'm trying to keep everything yeah. separate. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but I just don't want to have to mm -hmm. create a new account. Yeah, but now that we have the ability, let's move forward with that because that fixes Kendra's concerns and it's sure it makes more sense just mm -hmm. logistically. Yes. And it still changes our policies again. Yes. Yeah. So our policy would need to be updated to yes. Yes. Sure. And edited to reflect that. Yes. We can do that. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So just a question before we leave, will you show me how you can get a page yeah. to join a group? Because I literally have yet sure. to be able to figure it out. Yep. So if you can show me, that'd be great. Thank you. And you can reach out to Kevin Cologne on our staff, who's like an expert in Facebook. So um, if you have I, questions I need to do that too. and need help, feel free to email Kevin. And, and if you have questions, he can help you figure stuff out. Great. Good. Thank you. The other piece of, I think, of this discussion that we wanted to touch on was about blog posts. Yeah. And that, I don't think that's really even touched in our, our, uh, our policy. Yeah, it's, it's so it's a little bit. Yeah, it is a little bit, because okay. it is included in the term social media. Um, so it is, it doesn't specifically talk about blogs here, because yeah. um, it really does focus more on a Facebook type situation. But it does, it covers blogs. So we may want to actually expand this more if we want a different <coughs> policy for blogs, or, or a separate one, maybe not even different, but a separate one. Right. But it, and it's only, it's only Laura that has a blog, is that right? Uh, well, I know, you guys deleted yours, I presume? Yeah. Okay, okay. I, yes. I just want to That's be what clear. I thought. <laughs> I, well, I wouldn't have a blog. I, on at least two occasions, put something out in social media saying, this is why I felt the way I do. You know, at one, one time I actually cut and I had a script because I knew it was important and then I did a cut and paste of that script on a Facebook link page, on a Facebook page. On another occasion, I provided some background to why I said what I said. So it's just, I mean, I wouldn't call it a blog, it was just, you know, it was more commentary. But that would probably fall under this, the Facebook policy, so you'd probably be covered. Yeah. I, I would yeah. agree. I think you'd be fine under it as written, but I think we may want to, I don't know if we want to, like you said, expand it to separate blogs from this or how you all want to deal with that. So um, before we even go down that road, mm -hmm. I mean, just because you have a few minutes left. Right. Uh, I mean, so for instance, Laura's blogging. Mm -hmm. 
can we talk about risks to the town about what goes in that blog? Sure. And, and, and Laura and I have talked about this. So my first concern is that, when I mean, you and I have talked about this, is that obviously it looks a lot like an official town page, mm -hmm. especially when it looks like minutes. I mean, the way that you go through everything. And so that concerns me a bit because we have actual minutes and the difference is, is minutes go to the board and they get approved by the whole board and everyone gets to say, that's not what I said. And then we can all go watch the tape or whatever we need to do. But, and I know what you tried to do yesterday, whenever it was, was have everybody approve it. But that's kind of setting up, I think as Sandy said, that's setting up yet more sort of responsibility for all of the trustees yep. and for me, because I had to go through it as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I mean, that's really up to the board. I'm just saying that that's your time and my time to review the blog posts. And then it's really official. If I'm spending right. my time right. reading it for legal problems, then I think it's pretty much an official and to be clear, my apologies, I wasn't trying to take more of people's time. I was trying out a different approach and seeing if it worked. It didn't, so I certainly won't email again about yeah, this. Yeah, Laura and I talked about this er, Thursday or Friday. Yeah, Friday. And um, yeah, I, I, she asked what I thought. I thought it was a good idea because that gave the board members an opportunity to review it before it was posted. But I understand the additional time taken to review it as well. So. I mean, I, my concern gets to exactly what Kendra said. We have official minutes for a reason. I mean, it, I think it's great outreach. I love that you do it because clearly people do get benefit from it in our town. My concern, and clearly for me, was getting misquoted and getting a, a false attribution put towards my name. And I mean, if there can be a way that there's absolutely no attributions to anybody, then that's fine. Uh, I just happened to click on yours. I don't normally go and read the blog, so it was just kind of happy circumstance that I saw that. Um, even if it's not a legal issue, my concern is just making well, there's, sure. There's legal issues too. Um, you know, I mean, to be honest with yeah. the blog, I had to correct some things legally on it. Um, Which gets expensive for the town. And that's a policy issue. I mean, do you want, you all are the board. You direct the legal services I provide. You know, I was asked obviously by one trustee to look at it, I did. But on, you know, that's a one-time thing. But ongoing, do you all want to do that? You know, and it's a little difficult because it involves town liability. It also involves personal liability mm -hmm. to you. So, you know, I it gets a little blurry. That's all. This is a very personal issue because it's your blog. Mm -hmm. um, so, if it were a town blog, that would be easy. I would say, right. okay, run it by me. I would you know, edit it as necessary, but it's your blog. It's a little hard to tell right now whether it's official or not. It has a lot of attributes that look official. Right. Despite despite the disclaimers, which you put on at my behest, which I think is a good idea, it still looks pretty official right now. So, I, you know, I, I wish I had a clearer answer. I don't. Sure. So yeah. beyond, beyond kind of the disclaimers and all the tags everywhere saying it's not official, here's the link to the official site, is there anything I could do to make it not a fit, more not official? Well, I think one of the things is, as we talked about, not quoting other trustees or mm -hmm. attributing statements to other. I mean, in other words, if you make it more of your impression of how things go, mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful. This okay. is my view of how this meeting went. Then it's very personal to you. Mm -hmm. um, this is my observation of what happened at the meeting. You know, that might be helpful. It's probably some somewhat to do with the language um, as to how it's written. That might that might help. Um, you know. Uh, it, like I said, there's no bright line rule. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, well, you know, I mean, I'm torn on the issue because mm -hmm. I think, you know, hey, there's, you, you, you're, you're scratching an edge for the community, which mm -hmm. is good, okay? Is there another way that we could scratch the edge? Because I have, you know, a couple thoughts. I, I just think it's probably not a great practice, right? You and I have talked about this. I'm not talking about school, right? It's just not a great practice to try to provide attribution to somebody else or get in somebody else's noggin. Second, you know, it's exactly what Matt and staff should be doing because we have a process for meeting minutes. And so I like, if there's something wrong with that process, I like trying to fix it. Um, but I do think there's, you know, part of it just could be, you know, last week was interesting, right? Because you dissented on something, and I don't remember what it was, a dissent on, but I think it was, it, oh, it was the- uh, Economic dissent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is interesting. So I think to, in, in the, however many minutes you, t you know, if you wanted to later say, hey, I dissented on this issue, not only because of what I said, which is one, two, and three, but also four, five, and six, which weren't necessarily important for me, because I know I was going to spend my colleagues. So 
allow me as, a, as your elected official to let you know why I dissented. To me, that seems great. I did look because I got it on the email, the other stuff. Mm -hmm. There were like four things that I just disagreed with. I just okay. disagreed. And then I, but I sort of figured, okay, this is, I don't want to be in the, the official position of disagreeing. Mm -hmm. But if you, can't, if you just zeroed in on the reason why you dissented, then I thought that would be, to me, interesting. You know, it's good reading. Oh, and you also have a, a readership, right? And so the readership that gets links to the official minutes or things like that is also, you know, might help drive traffic to a more official place because that's really what we, you know, that's the bigger problem we've got to fix. Mm -hmm. You know, again, you're scratching an itch. We got to get back and figure out how do we get, you know, make engagement that verb, you know, that active mm -hmm. thing where people are going back and forth, and, and we just obviously still want to work together as a community, not as, I mean, as a board. So, Kendra will pass six. I yeah, I, got, I do have time. time. Um, but anything final from you? We can we can continue this discussion. But. I think we can, and and you and I can also talk further about yep. ways that you may that maybe we can change the language. But again, see, here I am doing it again. Right, this I is your block. Right. So I'm just in a tough position because I want to be helpful and I want to make sure we protect the town. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure whether this is official or not, I, even with all the disclaimers. So that's my concern about it. Um, and that's, if you if it was much more personal to you and much less looking like minutes, then I wouldn't have as much of a concern that it was official. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So maybe I'll just throw that out and we'll leave it at that for now. And if it comes up again, We'll deal with it then. Okay. Now, Kendra, I like that because you know I've been thinking about starting a blog just to uh, opine on why I did a certain right. thing. Right. And, and that's thing. I think that's and I don't want you to have to ever look at it because I don't want the taxpayers to pay for you to look at my crap because my writing <laughs> is terrible. And I don't think no, I don't think the taxpayers should have to pay for you to review my own commentary on what I did. Right. And I think this gives me good perspective on. That's what I'm. Yeah, I'm trying to kind of frame limit it, that. limit it, yeah. so that it is personal to you. Yeah. Um, uh, again, I wish I had a super clear answer on the best way to do that, but for now we're in a bit of a gray area. So I'm a little un unclear on, you know, what constitutes official or not. I mean, is this something that's viewed in the eyes of the reader? Like the reader is going to be thinking but, that this is something that is coming from the town? That's how it was in the case, the, the, the Virginia right. case. It was all in the eye of the beholder. So the person who was trying to comment it looked very official right. to that person, so. I mean, you know, like separate and apart from like anything that's actually like, you know, written on her page, like this is like it's a Laura, <clears throat> you know, Laura for Superior is the, mm -hmm. the the URL. You know, it's not the town's. It's not saying like, you know, town trustee, you know, Spojinski. It's you know, I, I, I don't think any reasonable person is going to look at that and think that this is necessarily sanctioned by the town. I, I just, I, that to me, I'm, I'm not really convinced about the. And you may, you may be measure. right. I, I, may I, be I may also be wrong, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm not really seeing how like anybody would actually think that this is, um, you know, approved by, by the town. But it also shouldn't be, right? Like right. It, it shouldn't well, be approved the, by, by, agreed, by you. It shouldn't um, yeah. be approved by mm -hmm. uh, any of us. Um, you know, this is a personal blog. Of Laura's, you know, personal thoughts on, on the issue. You know, undoubtedly, she's got a First Amendment right to say whatever she wants to say. Sure. Um, and you know, I think that like the, the blog itself, uh, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why Laura connected with so many voters during the campaign is that she was you know kind of serving, scratching the itch that, that, that as Kevin said. Um, and you know, because I think we've had historically some problems with getting our our minutes out. And you know, if the only other way for people to learn about what's going on in town is periodically to read a Daily Camera article about, you know, one of eight topics on our agenda that may be newsworthy. Reading minutes that come out, you know, several months after the meeting, um, or, you know, sifting through a five-hour video or attending the, the meetings, um, you know, we definitely can do better in terms of just getting the word out. And I think that the blog does a good job in engaging with, with the community and telling people this is what happened last night, this is what I think. Um, you know, my only recommendation is just leave it to uh, recapping, you know, this is what we talked about, and you know, this is what the vote was, and you know, this is what I was thinking when I uh, voted a certain way, and you know, why I came out on this, this issue. 
I think it's fine to express opinions as to, you know, I wish the board would have saw it, saw it differently if you're on the opposite side or I want to thank the board for you know, being on the right side of this issue. I think it's uh, dicey to you know, attribute any uh, quotes to people because you, know, you can take quotes out of context. Certainly um, trying to summarize what people are saying or you know, paraphrase what they're saying um, or uh, uh, kind of represent what somebody was thinking. You know, that, that, that to me is just fraught with peril, right? Where you're going to get it wrong, where you're going to misconstrue what somebody said, what somebody was thinking. You know, you don't know what somebody's thinking. Like they might, mm -hmm. we might speak out loud and think out loud during a meeting, but that may not necessarily be the whole picture. I mean, I, I can't be held to account for the things that come out of my mouth during town board meetings. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be necessarily held accountable for anybody knowing what was actually going through my head at any given point in time. Um, because there's probably not much, but um, at any rate, I, I just think that if, if we be limited to, uh, that makes one of us. Uh, you know, if, if it's you know limited to, to just kind of, this is a summary of what we did, this is why I voted a certain way, and this is what the board right. decided to do without you know, representing any other particular trustee or the mayor and, and speculating about what the thoughts are, then I think it's going to be actually a better blog because you're not going to run the risk of getting it wrong and, and, and angering anybody. And you're also going to be more accurate because if you get it wrong, you're not actually doing the, the service that you want to do, which is to provide accurate information to the public, right? You want to get good information out to the public um, in a timely manner. And I think we can, we can do 98% of what you're doing without the attribution to. Right? The, and the only other, I'll just throw one other thing out there, even in personal blogs, and one of the reasons I did look at this is if it's a quasi-judicial land use application coming, mm -hmm. i.e. the concept plan, right. you've got to be really careful because it doesn't, it's not personal to you anymore then. Right. Then it affects the entire board and what happens later, for example, if this application is turned down. Right. Because all of that blog is coming back. Right. At, you know, and that will all be part of the litigation if mm -hmm. we get to, I'm just being overly paranoid here. But, mm -hmm. you know, so that's, that's when I have to get involved. So even right. if it's personal, if you're starting to talk about closet judicial land use issues, then I jump in. And that's really the only thing I commented on on your blog was just yep. that one. Yep. I don't touch the rest of it. But mm -hmm. just so maybe that's a good um, line to draw yep. to. And, and I apologize again. That was my misunderstanding, thinking the application hasn't been submitted. So I, yeah. so yeah, again, that's apologies. We've had that discussion. I know. We've had that a lot. We've had that one. I <laughs> wish <laughs> it were that easy. If it were that easy, it, it, would, make, it would make my job yeah. easier if that were yeah. easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I gotta run. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for doing all this first. Yes, correct. And so, just for clarification, the board, like, will send comments to Kendra and then bring it back for consideration of social media policy? Yes. Good. I think we need one. Yes, okay. Is there additional? I mean, we don't have to totally transition to another topic. Or so, also, I did want to, um, so I know, Mark, we were talking about. Mark and Kevin are talking about scratching the itch and all of that. Um, Matt, I do just want to commend staff. I think the notes have come out in a much more timely manner than they used to, so I think that that hole has really been filled. What I would, well, I think that the timeliness has been filled. What I would like to ask the board is, um, it is really more around the recap value of it, because to your point, the, the official videos are up there, and. I link to that, I link to the official meeting minutes once those come out. I still think that there is something missing around if someone isn't going to watch the eight hour video or if someone isn't going to scroll through the 10 pages of notes, it's all there as background. But I, I really think that there is a need for essentially news like coverage. The Daily Camera does an article on Superior every couple of months. Um, so they aren't, they aren't letting citizens know what's going on. And so we talked about this on Friday as well. Yeah. Um, we so we are sending out the weekly recap. Mm -hmm. So we did that this week for last week's meeting. That's yes. great, by the way. Which is yeah. excellent. So yes. I think that is helpful. That's helped a lot. And yes. This comes like it's coming 180 um, because there was a trustee on a former on a former board that didn't like the detailed minutes that we were providing because right. there was inaccuracies at times and stuff. And when you have that much detail, you're going to run into that at times. And so. The push then was to go towards more the action minutes, which yep. is what we've done. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you kind of want to go back to. I think we have the ability to 
discuss the minutes or not approve them. So if I, so hypothetical, if you're dissenting on uh, some quasi-judicial application around a development and you feel strongly that you are against it because the front, the, the front door does not orient toward, to a street, and I think it's fair to say I am voting no on this because it does the front doors do not orient to the street. If that was not characterized in the minutes, and I made that statement, I would personally be correcting the minutes and not following week. But in my experience, when I have made some declarative statement, Phil is somehow picking up that declarative statement, and I'm finding it in the minutes. If your declarative statements are not in the minutes, I don't think we should approve them. I think you should bring it up and ask for your declarative statement to be in. So less for me around are the declarative statements in there and more around our citizens are busy. They don't have time to read all, all through the minutes or watch the entire video. That's the hole that I think we haven't filled. Well, what if we start, I mean, the recap, uh, the recap's great. It's a paragraph and it gets everyone what they need to know from how each item ended. What if we literally put that at the top as an executive summary of our actual minutes? That way someone opens it up and it's right there. And then everything else is there below it. Does that fix that problem? So, and I know, I know I'm gonna sound very nitpicky here. I, I, love the, I love the paragraph in the Monday emails. I think that's fantastic. I think there's a level of detail between one paragraph and between 10 pages that'll take two hours to read through all of it. And, th and that's kind of where I've been trying to be is in that here's enough detail that you get a good sense of what's going on versus just, um, well, and again, Matt, I'll call out, I think the agendas have gotten much clearer over the last year as well. Um, it used to be when you read the agenda, you couldn't tell what was being discussed, and now I think that's gotten great. So I'm trying to be more detailed on the agenda, but less detailed on the minutes. And I think that's what's really missing. And that's what I continue to get feedback from residents. They are finding very valuable. I, and I think this, I personally think if you don't like something in the minutes and you want additional detail, I think it should be a agenda board item. I'm pulling the approval of the minutes for a discussion because I want to talk about it, right? It's not that the minutes are inaccurate if at all. Um, I think the minutes are too long for a regular citizen to take the time to read and digest. I don't think the minutes should be shortened. I think they serve a very important purpose, um, but I think that there is another purpose we're not meeting. I think there's a, sorry, I'm curious. No, no, no. Um, we're all struggling with the fact that, you know, print media is dead, it's dying. Mm -hmm. You know, Daily Camera used to cover lots of these meetings. Prairie Home Media now owns them and like 96 other newspapers and Anthony Hahn covers, you know, I think 2,000 square miles. Right. That is what it is. Um, trying to fill that void is difficult. Mm -hmm. and should it be a staff member that does it or a trustee? I think that's the question for me. Or, I, I or a citizen. Or a citizen. And, 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 and that's I weird. struggle with it being a trustee because of the hat right. and the perception of inside information under that hat. You know, Anthony Hahn, no one questions that he has inside information because he doesn't. He just watches the videos and he may call somebody, but there's never a perception of, hey, how did, how did he get that information? And I think with, with blogs by trustees uh, that go beyond just you know, my own personal opinion, uh, I think there's the risk of the position or the perception of information that may not be in the open record. I think that's just the, the, the difficulty here. I mean, we've got three branches of government and, you know, Media has always been that fourth dotted line branch. And we try to transcend that because we're filling that gap that exists in society today. We've got difficulties. And I don't know how to fix that other than potentially, you know, looking at staff or the citizenry to fill the gap. But to have the trustees fill that gap gets somewhat challenging. And, and that's where um, that's where Kendra and I have had a lot of discussions about how do we make clear that this is unofficial. This is not my view as a trustee, which is why I've splashed the disclaimers all over everywhere to to try to to your point wear a different hat and say this is my position, my personal position as a citizen. Um, really, because, I, because oh well, so I mean because to your point, I was I started doing this in June of last year, well before I was a trustee mm -hmm. as a citizen. Um, and at the time I said, you know, this is, 
I am all about transparency. This is what I would like to bring to the board, and I plan to bring it to the board if elected. So, I mean, I, I think the, uh, I think we, we've got kind of a couple different things we're talking about now. We're talking about, like, are, is, is the town actually doing enough in terms of sufficiently communicating, you know, information about our, our past meetings? And personally, um, I think the timely, you know, emails that we're sending along with the profile of these are the upcoming meetings for the week, and this is what was discussed last week, that coupled with you know, the adoption of the official meeting minutes um, is totally sufficient. I don't want staff time to be spending more time Agreed. watching uh, meetings, trying to get additional information. We're doing, I think it's it's more than we're required to do, and it's it's we're getting the, the timely stuff out there, and then we're getting the detail out there once we have the opportunity to, to review it in connection with the publicly noticed meeting and the opportunity to revise the the minutes to the extent that they're incorrect, right? And we can amend those minutes and then vote on them and then we've got the official record. That coupled with the actual access to the, the video, um, Sean Madej's artificial, you know, machine learning transcripts of, of the meetings. I mean, there, there's, you can get the information that you, you need with, uh, with those resources. I, I have no problem with Laura. If she feels she wants to, you know, write more um, on her personal blog about this is what we were talking about and this is how I came out and you're, you're getting more information to the public in a more timely manner than the adoption of the official minutes and you know, you're going into some of the detail of you know, this is why I, I voted on a particular issue or this is how I came out on this particular issue um, you know without attributing and this is what you know, Sandy thought about the issue and this is what Kevin thought about the issue just saying this is what we discussed this is what why I voted the way I voted, um, and that this is what the end result was. I think that's fine, and then I think we're we're getting to the same to the result that I think everybody wants, right? You're getting the opportunity to communicate, which is valuable. It's timely. It's more in depth, and then to the extent that the, the minutes come out when they come out, then there's that additional resource in the future. But I think we we solve everything by you know, maintaining the status quo with the modification of don't quote and attribute statements and intent to other trustees. And I don't think anybody here on the board, unless I'm reading this wrong, um, has a problem with that. I think it all comes down to, and again, I, we heard Kendra, it just comes down to uh, making it more personal, not mm -hmm. official. I don't know exactly what that means. So you're <laughs> clearly gonna have to wade into what the heck does that mean and start experimenting because that sounds like gray area to me and well Mark, i think the fact that it literally says all over it this is not official this the, is not official the problem here's is a link though, to the official record i mean that's but i don't know how i can be more clear well because you're a trustee and you're talking about town business so no matter how hard you try to take off that hat that has just stuck to you no matter what you write so if there's anything that wades into uh if there is an inaccuracy or anything like that, even if it says this, this is not official, people are automatically just going to assume it's correct and you're right because you were there and you're part of the governing body and that is what it is. So, I mean, I, I personally disagree with Mark's statement earlier where he said it's not a doc of uh, email or website. It's clearly personal. I still, I mean, Kendra said it's in the eye of the beholder. And if I'm the beholder, you're a government, or a government figure elected a figure and I would expect that whatever this is is I'm gonna take it for being accurate so if it is more of a personal statement this is how I feel getting to where Kevin was going that's great represent your views and all that if you want to say we ended uh, in the way of voting for this that's also great but I don't know where that line is and I think personally I'd like Kendra to keep looking at it for at least a little while until she feels comfort, just because I still see lots of risk here. Uh, just because I don't know how I would, I, I would implement it if I were you. But I mean, I mean, then like, where do you draw the line, right? Like, so I know, right? You That's your, what you I'm saying. Your trustee Facebook page, like, and you want to engage with with the public, you know, and you know, I mean, uh, I put on a post today about a number of different issues, you know, Jefferson Parkway and Rocky Flats, and I'm not saying that this is what the board. Thinking, I'm just saying like these are some some issues that are coming up. This is what's on my mind. 
Um, you know, I think that, you know, otherwise the only answer is basically to, uh, you know, squash like all discussion because you're fearful of thinking that like, oh, well, I'm talking with my trustee hat and people are going to attribute this to the entire board. And we don't want to do that. I mean, that's like a slippery slope here. So we want to encourage people to engage with us and we engage with them and, you know, we let the public know, you know, this is what we think about certain things. And we're going to do that in different ways. Like some people are going to use Facebook and Twitter. Other people are going to use a blog. Other people are going to be using, uh, you know, First Fridays and engaging with residents that way. I mean, we want to encourage open and frank discussion with our community, right? Because that's the way we represent the public is by actually talking to them, figuring out what's on their mind, letting them know what's on our mind. And I just, I, I don't want, it's easy to get kind of fearful of, oh, uh, there's the, you know, legal things that this may be, you know, problematic, you know, um, and this is going to be like an official yeah. publication, but like. It, and I don't, I don't want to go down the road that you're saying where we all stop and get too scared. I mean, and again, I think the need Laura's feeling is great and I'm glad it's there because clearly we've heard citizens say this is awesome. So it needs to be there. It is, if doing nothing is a zero and doing uh, basically minutes is a hundred, I think Laura's closer to an 80, maybe you're closer to a 60, uh, some of us are closer to like 20s, 30s, whatever. Uh, where is that line? And my concern is more just let's implement what Kendra tried to say and mm -hmm. just make sure Kendra gets to that point that she feels comfortable because that's when I get comfortable. Because I feel we are close to going over that, mostly because I've seen over the past month false attributions to myself and I have a real problem there. So we need to transition on yeah. another topic, but I'll just I'll close out with my thoughts. And, and that is that I, I do commend you for getting the following that you've gotten I mean, in your campaign and you're definitely filling a need in the community. But I think the moment that you were elected, um, the hats do switch. And, and the, the idea of being a reporter, uh, reporting on what the body is saying it absolutely has to change because you're now, you are inside the building and, and inside um, a lot of information that um, you know, sometimes can't be disclosed. And, and then the idea of, of what trying to uh, capture what everybody else is saying is, is just, uh, as others have said, it's just, it's fraught with peril. And um, I, I don't really want to always be looking at it. it. It concerns me that Kendra's having to look at it, that Kendra's spending time and taxpayer dollars on, on looking at this. It, it concerns me that board members are, are cons, you know, second guessing what they're saying and what's being said about them. We need to, I, I, what I'm hearing is everybody's good with the blog, good with you expressing Laura's opinion on Laura's vote, but as far as what everybody else is saying, let's let the minutes capture that and have it be more about you. And, and so I think if we can I think if we move into that place, I'm good with that. I, I just, it really concerns me that we, that we, um, you know, that, that board members have got concerns about, you know, actions of a, of another board member. So I just, I hope we can move. Closing. Well, so that just shifts the discussion from kind of what I think we were all saying, um, where I think, I think, Ken, you described it well with the minutes are 100. Um, the paragraph recap is awesome. It's a 20 on the level of detail, which is great. It serves very different purposes. Um, I, I don't know that I feel comfortable completely changing to solely my opinion when we don't have anything in the 60, 70, 80 range. That said, I agree with, I think, Mark, maybe you said this, I might be mistaken. I don't, I also don't think we should spend taxpayer dollars trying to have town staff publish something else that is in the 60, 70, 80 range. I think we have the high level of detail and the low level of detail. I think that's what the town should be providing. I really would like to figure out how I as a citizen can still provide something in that 60, 70, 80 range. I just don't think you are a citizen reporter, you're an elected official, and those are two different things. I, I think if you wanted to be.
be someone that was reporting on someone that's not elected. I, that's where I, I just, there, there's just a disconnect here that um, I just don't know that you can wear both of those hats. It's, I mean, I'm hearing from Kendra that you know, legally it's difficult to wear both of those hats. I'm hearing from board members they don't want that hat being worn. And I don't really want that hat being worn because I just, it's creating, we've got a lot of other things that we should be talking about besides this. And, and to the extent that. Well, I, I, I agree with almost everything you said right up to that second. I think we need to, I do think we need to, we, we gotta give, how, what's our, do we have a hard stop? What's our hard stop? I, I listed nine. Okay, I thought so. Yeah. Okay. Six. So, or, or, yeah. I, I had it on my calendar seven, five seven, to seven all of a sudden, I, but I, I thought too. originally we were going five to nine. Yeah, so. that's what I listed on the okay. agenda. Thank you. Okay. So if we're going five to nine, I think we can give this a little. And we don't have to go to nine. I don't yeah. necessarily want to. I, I haven't been sent on my taxes. I've got one more <laughs> review to do, and then I got to hit send. So, um, so yes, uh, I agree with what you're saying there, Clint. I just, I, I just don't want to kind of move off this. Too. I guess I meant in, I meant more in terms, not necessarily tonight. I just, it, as long as this continues to be a push and pull with, with among board members, we're going to continue bumping into this in future meetings, in future weeks and months, when I think we should be using that time and oxygen to be focusing on other things. I mean, I, I, go ahead. Well, I, it's important that any group you're part of, sports team, employer, trustees, that we be highly functioning and not be forced with distractions. I think this mm -hmm. has become a little bit of a distraction. I just kind of want to get to the other side of it. And I think if ultimately, you know, I, I tend to, anchor to this thing of transparency and that's what we're trying to do and if it's somewhere in between i don't know the, the 80 and the 20 and there's a need for somebody in the community or there's a need for town staff to somehow do this if it was anthony hahn who was pushing out something or i don't want to pick on anything but there's some reporter who was pushing something and there was an attribution that i didn't like i would either tell people i knew to ignore that attribution because he's a reporter or she's a reporter that doesn't necessarily know anything or i'd be in touch with that reporter saying you know, please have a correction. It's challenging when it's a board member, which leads to the, A, potential dysfunction within this tight-knit organization, and B, may have the unintended consequence of, instead of driving important collaboration on issues like what goes across the street or how do we solve the, the town center issue, the, uh, the uh, uh, community center issue, uh, or potential litigation or anything else, we're, we're to talk through this but we can't but the you know the underlying tenant none of us can restrict your ability to say whatever the heck you want to say right and so that's the difficult thing and we don't want to have a it would be a bad practice a slippery slope to have a a policy that says we should not publicly comment on things that to me is not an option so we need to continue to roll up our sleeves and look for this option and I thought we were centering around this thing that was, let's try to make sure that we approve the meeting minutes as they're described in sufficient detail that every, that all seven of us are satisfied with. That if somebody wants to run a personal blog to add some additional color to what they were thinking, I think that's a good practice. But trying to split the difference between the additional detail that somebody might not find in the minutes versus a very reasonable expectation that nobody's going to watch a five or six hour uh, meeting or remember what Sean Bidet's engage citizens.us citizens. Citizens. Um, is capturing. I, I think it's a noble cause. I, I don't think it's for you to solve. And I think it's, it's, an, a, it's a problem everywhere. It's a problem that we don't have newspapers. You know, we don't have competitive newspapers. We don't, we have a biased media you know, whatever your bias is. It is a clear problem, but I don't think it's the job of an elected official to try to provide that unbiased thought. I just think, I 
think is an overreach for any elected official. So, if, I was going to say, if I could just make a comment. I don't think the issue here, at least based on everything I'm hearing, is transparency. We are as transparent as we absolutely can be with our minutes or with our meetings. We run the, the tapes out there. The issue is, how much do people want to spend their personal time delving into this, and is it our responsibility to, you know, for want of a better word, spoon-feed information to our residents and to condense it or whatever? We are transparent. We allow these meetings to be watched live, and we also have them on tape. So it's not, if we weren't, if we weren't releasing that information to the public and they couldn't see it the minute the meeting's over, then I'd have a concern about transparency. Um, so, you know, if are we putting it in the language that's easiest for them to read? Well, sometimes I'm not the clearest person when I talk. It's not anybody else's job to to clarify that for me. So, I think we're transparent. I I really commend Matt and his staff for the changes they've made where we're sending out the synopsis of the meetings. The minutes are being published in a prompt manner. I can't remember the last time that we had a board meeting that we didn't see the minutes. I mean, that literally means we're turning them around in a week because the packet comes out on Tuesday. So, um, you know, I think Kendra has given us a good interpretation. Laura, if you want to say, this decision was made, and this is my opinion on the decision. Awesome, but it sh it shouldn't be your job to interpret what happened in the meeting because you may have a very different interpretation than I do. So that is not an official record; it's just your impression of what happened. So um, I I I beg to differ that this is a transparency issue. We are transparent. We we release this information as quick as it happens, and it stays out on the website, and then the minutes are available within a week. It's pretty darn good. Um, and it, I will go 100% with Kevin. It doesn't take two hours to read the minutes of our meeting, because we all read them, or at least I hope we all do, <laughs> to make sure that the information is attributed to yeah. us correctly. And if it's not, it's my job to correct it, and I have done that from time to time with Phyllis. And if it's if it's a substantive issue that she feels like we need to bring to the board, but sometimes it's just like, no, no, I know that wasn't the word I used, um, and we fix it. So um, let's let's stop saying transparency. This is not a transparency issue. This is are we simplifying this to the degree that we make it easy for all of our residents? So um, that's my comment. Um, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I just, I do not want anything that I said or did um, communicated by someone else. Um, I let my own actions speak for themselves. So, so you know, my, my general kind of conclusion in, in all this is, I, I think this is a really simple problem to fix, and I don't think um, this should involve, you know, Kendra reviewing or any of us reviewing, I think you put it in as much detail as you want to put in there. And I don't have any problem with that. I think where you draw the line is with, you know, quoting and attributing and, and speculating about intent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so long as you're not putting words in people's mouths, putting thoughts in people's heads, you're saying like, this is my recap of the meeting. This is what we voted on. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with you saying these are some of the topics that were discussed. You know? Heard from the public about X, Y, and Z, and some of the, the board you know, talked about you know A, B, and C. I mean, all of that you're being informative, you're kind of recapping in a timely manner, um, but you're just not saying you know. And Neil thought this, and Ken said that, mm -hmm. um, because that's where you're going to run into uh, a, a, a sticky situation where you're going to be imp imposing a burden on somebody else to make sure that that's right, mm -hmm. um, versus just saying. You know, there were some concerns raised about you know these topics, and we heard you know a couple you know good comments from the public about X, Y, and Z. And I think you can really you know bring a lot of value to the community in terms of what you're communicating, without 
running the risk of you know, misattributing something or, or uh, you know, getting a quote wrong. So you know, I think you're going to get you know, 95 percent of the thrust of what you're currently doing by just making that kind of bright line rule, just no attributions, no speculations about other what was you know in other trustees' heads. And so to your, I mean, to your point, Mark, based on our conversation, that's that's what I ended up doing with the post that I put up today, is making sure there's no names in it, there's no attribution. Um, I want to confirm, is the rest of the board comfortable with that approach? I am. Well, I haven't read it, but I'm not comfortable if you say one trustee said. Because again, I got to read it to figure out, okay, did you say, did I say it? Did Clint say it? Was it a conglomeration of, so I really have an issue with any statement that says, this was the general impression of the board. You do not have the general impression of the board. So, uh, you know, I, when I read the document and I, say, and I saw one trustee said, I was like, no, 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 no. Because now you're, all you did was remove our names. So now I've got to look at it and say, okay, was it me, maybe? Was it Ken, maybe? Was it Neil? We know it probably wasn't Kevin or Mark or Clint because you attributed comments to them. So it's probably the three of us. So, so to be clear, I have not attributed comments to anyone. I've removed all okay. from, from today. I have not yet gone back. I can remove names from every single post that I've ever made. But for today, what I did was made everything anonymous. Okay. Yeah. I just I don't but that's, have that's not what you post. Yeah, so no, that's, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, even I didn't spend a lot of time looking at the one no, that, but I, I tend to, I, to be honest, I want to distance myself from them. I, your characterization of the uh, affordable housing, I think, was a mischaracterization. Okay. And I want to distance myself. It does not reflect my values or the board's values, and I distance myself from your characterization of what was discussed. I think it reflects poorly on all of us. It shouldn't be. And it's not, there was no attribution that you had your trustee have. So affordable housing is a problem that we we're going to solve in this town, and there's 60% of what you've written is about taxes. It, it's awful to me, personally. But obviously, we're going to have disagreements on I, which I want to have in right. a publicly noticed meeting, and I'm ready, obviously. Yeah. And so I want to have these disagreements and dialogue, and that seems like the medium right. to have so. So this I mean, is not a medium that I. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like for, personally, like you know, if, if if I were you know to put something on Facebook today and I said, you know, like I feel really passionately that you know the Jefferson Parkway should not get built, right? And you know, and these are the reasons why I I think that it's a terrible idea. Right? And you know somebody else on the board might think it's a great idea, and um, I don't. I'm not representing what you think. I'm not representing what the board thinks. I'm representing what I think, and I think that that's important for me to be able to do. Uh, it's important for all of you to know kind of where I stand on issues, and it's important for the, the public to know. But it's not and then when I get something wrong, you know, they can call me out on it, and you know we can have that debate. So you know, I. I I guess I, I, I didn't read the, the, the specific thing on the affordable housing, so I would I need to kind of go back and, and see it, but I don't think you're, are you attributing things like the board? No, there's no attribution. It's yeah. just, it's a meeting summary that has, um, it's, this is not a, this is not a negative word, this is just a word. It has a bias, right? Mm -hmm. it, it can, you cannot help but bring your bias to this. Okay. I have a bias around affordable housing. You will hear my bias when we talk about it. It, it. It's, But it's presented as a meeting recap. It's not presented as, here's what my Laura's thoughts are. The post around, starts out with that, around, exactly. Around, it's, you know, during, but it starts with during the presentation, and then it goes on to, here's what was discussed. It's not, here's what I feel about affordable housing. The, At least maybe it was updated, but the, one, no, so, and I, I clarify any time I make an update because I would never want someone to think that I've changed something um, after the fact. But I, I start out the entire blog post with, this is an editorial that represents one person's interpretation of the meetings. 
It's the same I put in my email signature. I have a line that says, this email does not presume to speak for the rest of the board. It is my opinion only. And that's, I'm really trying to make that clear. I would not presume to speak on behalf of any of you. I'm one member of a seven person board. And I think, and so again, I mean, I think you can, can you can continue to do this and I think it is fine. It is just the consequence of doing so will be a less functioning organization because again, I mean, I, I like the characterization of the hat. And you know, the hat you are wearing is not one that is opining on the, the, the challenges of affordable housing in Boulder County. The hat you are wearing in doing so is a one person's opinion of, of a, it is called a meeting recap. I mean, you've introduced this as a recap. Mm -hmm. It's not introduced as a- It's a personal recap of how I felt, with what I took from the meeting. And, and again, that disclaimer statement right at the very beginning, the following should be considered an editorial that represents one person's interpretation of the meetings. For the most unbiased and complete information, I would encourage residents to watch the meeting video itself and draw their own conclusions. Visit the town website at superiorcolorado.gov for the official meeting video and meeting minutes with a link. I, I just, I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm not suggesting you, you can or should change your mind. It's just, I just, I personally want to distance myself from the characterizations because I, I don't necessarily have to worry about the attribution. Sue and I have talked about it. I just, you know, my voice will speak for itself and I'll, if I, if, if I get, if somebody's actually, if somebody wrongly characterizes something I said, I don't know, it's just not that big deal. But to me personally, but if there is a reflection of something we need to do as a board, you know, or somebody that does really great work and then presents their great work, and we as a, one of us as a board characterizes their great work differently than they would have chose to have it characterized, I think it does not, it it has that unintended consequence. So, and so this one, the affordable housing one, will have an unintended consequence. The reputation of Superior will continue, which is a reputation that I think a lot of us would prefer to have changed. So I think this gets to the point I was at least trying to make earlier where, I mean, Mark, I appreciate what you're saying is it seems like simple steps going forward, but Kendra's statements of make this more personal, I don't feel is necessarily solved by your solution. I, because we're running into exactly what Kevin was saying right now. I mean, just the fact that we've heard that says there's, we're still not into this safe zone yet. And I, I can disagree. I think what, what Mark said, and I think where I see it differently with the board wrote email to us because I haven't gone to your blog I just have what you emailed us. Gotcha and I've changed it since then so Which, yeah, before I publish yeah. it based on the feedback yeah. I got from and, and that's fine I think Mark what you said and why your Facebook posts seem to work is a lot about me it's all about you it's not you never once talk about I think the board ought, did this or ought to do this it's it's unequivocal that when you write it's about what you want to see the board do it's before the board makes a decision a lot of what we're seeing from Laura is post haste post discussion and it's a summary and it's trying to thread the, the or, or trying to distinguish what's the board versus her is impossible for me. Like I can't distinguish what's her opinion versus the board opinion or, or whatnot. So I, I think that's a gray area of, of what you know, we're, we're kind of trying to deal with is, you know, depending on when you write and how you write, it's either very gray, you know, which hat you're wearing, or it's very clear that Mark was wearing his trustee mayor pro tem hat, and he's got some very strong opinions, um, and the town can see that. He's got to go and sway the rest of the town to see that, but you know, at least he's trying to make the case. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think I, I see that point. Um, you know, I, I have done kind of recaps in general to, you know, on, on things that happened in the past too, um, and so you know, I don't think they're necessarily like prospective versus you know past uh, decisions. You know, personally, like I, I am not concerned with uh, kind of moderating content. And, and like, I think, you know, we write what we write and people are gonna judge us based on what we write you now. And there's gonna be, some people might like what we write, some people might not. And 
you know, ultimately we're making those decisions to write what we're writing. And I, I you know, I'm reading what was on the affordable housing, you know, com recap presentation. Um, I'm curious as to understanding, Kevin, your your concerns about it, because I, you know, I look at it and I don't particularly have any concerns with with that section, um, based on the email that we got yesterday uh, from Laura that sent the, the draft blog. Um, you know, I, I think. You know, I, I, I just don't see how this is going to be construed as an official publication. I get like she's wearing her trustee hat, but that to me is not like a deal breaker. I think it's it's fine to just say like this is you know what I think and this is what the board you know did, what this is what the board saw and heard and you know I found these things interesting and um, you know, I don't have any problem with any of that. I, you know, I, I look at it, this is purely a uh, respect and an interpersonal relationship kind of exercise where it's like, let's just be careful not to attribute, you know, because I could publish on, on a blog that I think, you know, Ken is a terrible human being and, uh, you know, he probably won't appreciate that I do that. Um, I've got a first amendment right to do it. Um, and, you know, whether I'm wearing my trustee hat or my citizen hat, uh, it doesn't necessarily make any difference you know, from a legal perspective. I don't think anybody's gonna look at it and say like, that's the official policy of Superior. But that's because the official policy of Superior has never opined on whether I'm a good person or not. Yeah. It's, also, it comes to the content of what's in there. Yep. Yeah. Bad example, but um, there were enough members of Tennis Superior who saw you dancing on Saturday night. Like, <laughs> oh. So, um, <laughs> But uh, you know, be that as may, you know, you're going to have a reaction to me choosing to represent something about you, right? and and that's just a question of, you know, to Kevin's point about you know we need to work together and be a functional organization. Um, so you know, like ultimately at the end of the day, like I don't want us in the business of policing anything that any of us say. Um, you know, we certainly shouldn't be signing up to do more work to moderate any of the content. Yep. Let the content stand on its own, but as a showing of respect to your colleagues. Just don't put words in other people's mouths. Don't make attributions to other people's thoughts. And then I'm fine just moving on with the other things that we've got on the agenda today and going forward. Okay. Are others okay with that approach that Mark just outlined? I, I'm just gonna likely continue to kind of distance myself from it. So I just, I, you know, more power to you, right? I will do my also occasional thing, and you'll have, you'll have a cadence and a frequency that far exceeds mine, and a level of energy and enthusiasm, which is fantastic, and I don't want to get into that at all. Um, but I just, oh, I have the same question. Uh, but I, I will likely, um, you know, just, I just think it's a, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get to a place where everybody's, comfortable and appreciative of it because it appears and I don't want to, it appears that what, and I don't know the difference, I haven't studied them, but it appears that what Mark is doing is there's comfort around and there's discomfort with the blog post and I don't, I, I think it's the level of detail. Right, you might analyze the reason why, but it's the, it's not just, I think it's the level of detail, but it's also that personalization and I, okay. you know. Let's do Rocky Mountain Airport expansion discussion next. Can we take a two minute break? Yeah, and take a, <laughs> take a short break and then, cool. then we will jump into airport. Thank you. About 11%, yeah. so that's good. That's good time about that. Got a recharge, everybody's got a recharge. <laughs> Yes, 
Let's dive back in. We're on to the Rocky Mountain Airport expansion topic. Yeah, um, Kevin had asked me a question um, earlier about um, he heard that the airport was planning or had plans to expand the airport, build a new terminal, and uh, have commercial passenger service, scheduled commercial passenger service at the airport. I confirmed that that was something they were talking about, and the airport director seems to have a desire and plans. I don't know if it's coming from the Jefferson County Commissioners or him, but he did confirm that those are long-range plans that the airport would like to do. Um, and then Neil um, suggested also that we add it to the retreat agenda to discuss, um, and he had specific questions um, that I've included on the agenda with regard to our involvement and how what stance we want to take on it and position and start being more active. If this was something that the airport had discussed before I was even here, um, and Louisville had started gathering community support to fight it. And actually, I, Phyllis sent me something. They looked like they were going to put something on the ballot. It's this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know if that actually got on the ballot or not. But so this is something it seems like the airport has some long range plans. To Drew was going to put something on the ballot. Louisville, Louisville City of Louisville. In 95, they, they at least drafted, I think it was on the ballot. I can't find the records, but it was sort of does Louisville want to take a position against the expansion of the airport for commercial service? Um, when I suggested this topic to Matt, you know, I put my the thought bullets underneath it, but not necessarily that I wanted them out here. They're just like sort of stream of consciousness with anything else. I apologize. Um, because, you know, at least in 95, Dr. Cog got involved and said DIA will be the airport of choice for commercial service, period. Um, so they came out and, you know, you know, against expansion of, at the time, Jeffco Airport. Um, I don't know if Dr. Cog's position has changed, um, and that's why I wanted to have this conversation you have. Rock Mountain Airport, Jeffco, want to go in that direction. How does the rest of Dr. Cobb feel about it? How does Louisville, Broomfield, Superior, how do we feel about it? You know, maybe commercial service, you know, B737 is fine overhead is okay. Um, but it's something, you know, at least from an engagement perspective, RMA, RMA, but we'll be def deficient. And, and I work down in Centennial, and that airport has been very proactive about engaging with its community. <coughs> and I think we've all kind of felt that Rocky Mountain is a little deficient there. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's just perception on my end. I don't know. I think, you're, I think the, the background and the thinking around engagement with Louisville and what uh, Dr. Cog thinks, I think those are all important questions. But I think there's a first, there's a question first, what do we think about that? And so I, I would just like to start with that fundamental question. Yeah. Like, I'm absolutely against being the, the, any increased commercial flights. I recognize that I used to have a single commercial flight or maybe a couple that went between here and uh, where was it? There's a Phoenix flight on the 757. Yeah, there's, there's, the, there's an occasional commercial flight, but I personally would be not supportive of expansion, which would include the 757s or 37s. So, and when, you know, I happened to be on the golf course when that one landed uh, a week ago Monday or a couple weeks ago on that Monday or Sunday, whatever it was. It was, you know, yeah, it was a cool plane and it was surprisingly quiet uh, because it must have been, you know, it was a charter and maybe it was a new engine or whatever it was, but it was, it was pretty scary seeing that thing come over. I would not want to see 16 of those things coming over our town every day. So, so I personally would. That's how I feel personally, but I don't, but I'm curious how the community feels and how this board feels. Does Centennial have similar? Do they? Do they have, I actually you know, don't think they have commercial service. I think they looked service. at it and um, Arapahoe County sued the airport and went all the way to the Supreme Court. I don't think the Supreme Court weighed in on it because the appellate court struck it down. Um, the FAA has purview, so the town couldn't stop it. But I think Centennial has never expanded commercial service. Supreme Court. They have a, a commercial flight. Um, it's a shuttle service that goes out to Grand Junction. Okay. The only reason I know that is because we have a Grand Junction office and one of my law partners. Yeah. When he comes to Denver, he flies into yeah. Centennial. Yeah. Um, but it's not a you know, United or yeah. Delta. It's it's, it's, it's like Denver.
the original yeah, so yeah. Yeah. And it's not a 737. No, it's, it's a, I mean, it's to grant injunction in here, it's one time a day, not what RMA, RMAA is anticipating with six, I don't know, was it six terminals? I can't even recall. Yeah, I mean, I mean, personally, yeah, I'm, I'm with Kevin. I I don't want to see 737s and 757s flying overhead. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I kind of question how this would, would work. I mean, I, I presume they would need to have like TSA agents and like a, you know, ability to actually like properly screen if they were doing like commercial flights. And I don't know where they would yeah, where they would put that. I mean, they'd have to build a new terminal yeah, um, would, to, and, to, to facilitate yeah. it. And Cheyenne so, has a small airport that you can. American Airlines flies from Cheyenne to Dallas Fort Worth, um, and they have TSA, yeah. they have security. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, but, but to me, to me, like this is a, a question of, like, absolutely, there. You know, people know that there's an airport when they when they buy their house and they're put on notice. There's a you know, navigation easement, but it's it's to me, it's a it's a question of scope and degree, right? And you know, it's one thing if there's a you know regional airport, you know, not the the main you know metropolitan airport like like DIA, but you know, a regional airport um, that is you know predominantly doing you know, private jets and you know, flight school traffic um, and you know I think people can kind of get used to that and understand that and sure like you know that that could grow over time um, but the, the question is when it morphs into something way more intense right, right. and so you know, I'm not too familiar with the you know the class 2 class 3 class 4 aircraft and you know what the application easement actually says with respect to any of that I'm kind of curious as to you know legal counsel's opinion on that as to um, you know, once you have a navigation in, easement in place, is it is that the end of the discussion and they could take off anything from there? Um, or is this something that they can, you know, we can have uh, a discussion with the airport and, you know, is there you know, potential you know, claims to assert or, uh, you know, grounds, like legal basis that we could use to object to an increase scope? Because, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, a safety concern. I mean, we don't want to have some... 37s and 757s flying, you know, low over Superior as they're approaching the airport. I mean, that's that's not what our neighbors signed up for when they they bought their houses. Sure, like we will have the bigger, you know, firefighting you know, planes, and I don't think anybody has a problem with that because they understand that this is a seasonal thing and it's to address, you know, forest fires in, in the Rockies. Um, and then every now and then we'll have, you know, some F-16s that are taking off there, you know, an air, air shore here and there, or, or you know, something, some military use. I think everybody's okay with that, you know, because they understand that that's not necessarily going to happen all the time. But converting this airport into a major commercial airport, I mean, that's going to have traffic impacts, like just on the streets, you know, in terms of like people accessing. I mean, I don't think that that airport's really designed to handle, um, you know, the amount of cars that would be coming into and, and parking. Um, Certainly, the neighbors didn't sign up for that kind of traffic. So, my position on this is we absolutely uh, oppose, and you know, we do everything that we can to oppose the increased kind of capacity of, of the airport for commercial uses. And we should we should leverage our consultants who are already working on our behalf as at least the first step to engage in the dialogue. Can I just ask, before we talk about kind of any, the strategy to oppose, can we just, I'd love to get everybody's pulse that they feel like you do, like I do, like this is a bad idea. Because maybe somebody thinks it's a great idea and they're familiar with members of the community that don't want to go to the DIA, don't want to go there. So fly to the Springs or Phoenix or wherever. So do we, how does it, how does it, how do others feel? So I asked for the song here. The airport is what it is. We all moved in here you know, with an expectation. It's been growing. Um, you know, I think financially, as we talked about, with respect to the consultant, Broomfield and Jefferson County are benefiting from that growth. You know, we don't get compensated for our airways just for the FAA rules. Um, so you know, it is growing. Um, but there's a distinction in my mind with private versus commercial. And I, I do not want to see that airport take up commercial growth because you know, there's also the ultimate question is, why are they even going this direction? I think it's because the RMA is losing money and going on the commercial path and expansion is an easy way in, in, in the world of government to try to solve the sinking ship, is just make it bigger. Um, and I think there's 
a lot of benefit to the town of Superior, at least to take a position that you know, growth, unencumbered commercial growth, is really not in the interest of the town. I'm a little bit nuanced, in my opinion, here. Um, I, I would be against the larger aircraft, the 737s flying overhead. I'm not necessarily against commercial flights if they are, if they continue to be the smaller planes. And to me, it's it's a big noise and impact difference between the two. And so I think to Mark's point, you know, we signed up to live here. We knew what it was going to be, but we also didn't think that there would be like dream liners flying over us. And so I'm, I'm fine with saying, let's take a stance against that. I, I would not support saying no commercial at all if the planes are the same size and similar impact. I would like to hear more details about what they're planning. I mean, a flight or two a day is is very different than six, seven dozen flights a day. So that's a difference to me, or, or maybe couple of times a week versus every day I mean, we, we quickly get to be okay with those gigantic firefighting planes which a lot of those are old and uh, you know if we're, if we're truly concerned about safety you know occasionally flying around is probably not a lot different than <clears throat> anyway it's so I, I'd like to hear a little bit more information about it I from a, I mean, from a resident standpoint, it, I think the more stuff, whatever it is, flying over our heads is probably not desirable. Um, but at, this, at the same time, it's an interesting question of, of what is, what are they really, what are they really talking about? And uh, so, just like more information. And I think our, I mean, maybe jumping ahead a little bit here, but I think our consultants that we have in place are, are probably the best avenue to how to um, drive our discussion whatever it is I, I follow I follow a very similar uh, path as, as what clean outlined <clears throat> I not knowing the volume that they're talking about and not knowing the outcome of current consultants if we find out that through our consultants work that there's a flight path that works otherwise it is not nearly as impactful to superior residents and then that can be implemented for commercial as well then I, I don't necessarily see the need to jump in and tell the, the airport how to do their business uh, if we're unsuccessful and it continues to be a big issue for our residents and absolutely I get behind it I just don't know that we're at that point and I think we're getting we're going down the right path to get to that point uh, so what the director said at the meeting, uh, four gate terminal east of Sims Road near the new Pilatus building, you know, um, used for commercial flights, 18 flights a day of 737s. And, and the real question that's still outstanding is flight path, because that, that was specifically one of the things that consultants said they'd be looking into to see can things be altered. Mm -hmm. Uh, without knowing what that result is. I mean, this, those numbers really might not have that big of an impact on Spear residents if the flight paths are altered and they're not really coming directly over Spear anymore. I, I, I tend to disagree because there's always going to be a wind right. a wind issue and they're going to have to reroute everything back yeah. over the town. And there's no way a 737 issue. is going to be able to apply Spear right. unless the they only yeah. take right. well, it. And, and I think that's where if we go down this flight path route, we have to have checks and balances on it where... If, if we're going to say, you know, flight paths over Superior are not acceptable, we need to have a way to measure that. that. Yeah, that's why I think you're being, yeah. I think we as a community would be a little naive to think we're going to have any. Your most important Understood. thing, anytime an airplane goes in the air, I want it to be safe yep. and get to its destination. So, uh, or, you know. And I think that's what right. if people who fly airplanes want right. to have <laughs> too. Right. I mean, so it, the thing, just to so, be honest. Right, so, so to think that we're going to suggest that, you know, not... Anderson. turning left or right over superior because that's what something said. I think. The, the FAA is going to turn the plane the way it is right. to be safe. I mean, if there's and a right. we're not going to the, you know, we're not going to be able to say, you can't take it to 737. We can say we don't want 737s coming out of that. Right, so great. So my, I, it feels like, it mean you know, safe. having the director 
we might not be able to get where I kind of thought where we'd be, which is take an unequivocal, unequivocal position that expansion to commercial flights inclusive of 737s is a terrible idea, right? It sounds like we might still need to collect more information and invite the director to speak with us and let him know, let us know directly what their plans are. So I mean, if you, they said it in their own meeting. I, you know, their meeting minutes aren't exactly clear. At least I couldn't find them. Um, but you know, have them confirm that that's what their intent is, and allow them to hear from members of the community in to say, hey, I think that's a terrible idea. Or maybe there's members of the community who say, oh my gosh, I can't wait. I, I'm sick of driving it to Kansas to take that flight to, to you know, to Phoenix every day. Um, and hear from the board, right? Because I'll, I'll personally, you know, have questions that will signal. It's not something I would immediately be supportive of. I think that's a really good idea. Like, I, I think we just, we invite them here and say, listen, this is what we've heard. This is what your minutes say. What, what are the plans? And, you know, do, if, if they've got plans that they're going to be able to clearly articulate, then they shouldn't have a problem <laughs> talking to their you know, neighboring town and saying this is what the plans are going to be and then hearing from us. Um, but I think that that's probably the appropriate and respectful first step rather than us just going in guns blazing saying, you know, listen, you know, this under no circumstances can you fly 737s there and they're going to say, well, hold on, that was just a discussion point. We didn't actually have plans. Right. But, you know, if we've got a concern of the public and, and uh, we've got concern amongst the board, at least some, probably most of us. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think that makes sense. Let's let's invite the director here to talk about what their plans are, and let's ask questions. So can we do that? Yeah. As soon, the, as soon as the earliest meeting I can get in. Okay, great. Thanks. So, so beyond that, I mean, Rocky Mountain has a, a, a committee that meets on a regular basis. We don't have a defined staff member or trustee or any sort of you know, member. You know, I think about all the other committees that we're a part of. I can't recall that Rock Mountain's ever reached out to try to get you know, a member of Superior onto that, that board. Well, it did come up at an earlier meeting, and I can't remember where it was. We asked, and I, I can't remember if it was the current director or the previous director, we asked about having an appointee to the board. And at that point, um, he indicated that there was a representative from Superior on the board, but I think that representative was somebody who worked or owned a company that operates at the airport. And, you know, for me, I'm just sitting here going, no, nah, that's not what we're talking about. Um, so, but his position was there was somebody from superior on the board i don't know if that person's still on there or not but they weren't there representing superior they just happened to be from superior and so i, I think i was at that same meeting yeah. that was it was kind of announced uh, we've got this new group uh, we're, we're just ready to launch you know they basically picked and and yeah. part of our comment was well did we have an opportunity to be on that so their charter says the board is comprised of seven members and one alternate. Two members shall be neighboring business owners, two Jefferson County citizens at large, one neighboring residential property owner, one neighboring jurisdiction, and one airport tenant. And it looks like on their current board, they have a representative from Westminster as their neighbor, which, yeah. So na yeah, neighbors are neighbors in Boulder yeah. County. Well, no, but the point is they only take one neighbor. So right. the yeah, Westminster yeah. person being chosen. Yeah. And they've got like four or five neighbors. Right. Plural. Yeah. yeah. Which I don't I don't know how we'd go about changing that. I think it would be much more appropriate for them to have every right. neighbor represented. I think it was the director's like first week on the job yes. when I came, right? I yeah, yeah he even, was pretty new. There was even a little bit of confusion. He might not even have the full time job yet, but there was even a little bit of confusion around uh, he was talking about the benefits that taxes bring to the community, as I recall. Yeah. Well, and he talked about not being able to find his way to the airport. Right. So, I mean, you know, that he was yeah. still that new, so. Right. So to, and I'm sorry, Neil, you brought this up again, now I can't remember. The point around having representation, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I mean. laughs> 
Um, I mean, even if we can't be official members, um, I know we also received an email from residents and we talked about it at First Fridays. Um, could we have someone from the board or from the town that attends, even not in an official capacity? I think, you know, I think it goes beyond. I think we've got to figure out how to engage with Jefferson County as well. Agreed. Um, I'm just saying as, no, I think, yeah, as a starting point, I think yeah. we also have to, in parallel, engage with Jefferson County and sort of, for lack of a better term, demand transparency, to demand an equal seat at the table. And we derive zero economic benefit from that airport. Mm -hmm. And quite a bit of impact. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I always can. I'm always going to contrast this to Centennial because I've seen what they've done. Mm -hmm. I think we got an email this week around what they've yes. done. Just because I've used that airport, you know, just become a good community member. Mm -hmm. It's not, this isn't hard, it just takes work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if we can uh, get ourselves a, you know, some sort of advance notice before the meeting, because I think typically we find out about the meeting the day of. Right. Which case none of us can go. I'm guessing they're regularly scheduled. They are. Their next one is May 14th, so we do have that. And I wonder, Matt, is that something it would be possible for town staff to at least track the meetings and let the board know ahead of time? Yeah, I mean, I, that's what I put in my notes, is Great. to have the staff person attend um, and then uh, engage Jefferson County commissioners, either maybe set up I've talked to the Jefferson County managers, like contact him, see about setting up a meeting between one or two of the commissioners and one or two of the board members. It'd be interesting to find out also just my own benefit to find out how Broomfield feels about this thing too, because they're sort of, to some degree, they're sort of like us. They don't derive, they get some economic benefit because it's in their jurisdiction, but not as much. So, just to clarify, I'm, I. There's clearly a risk here, but my biggest concern is that if we come out too strong on this, that we already have an iron in the fire. We're trying to do well for our residents right now. We have a consultant out there trying to figure out a way to bait the noise, but it's all voluntary. Mm -hmm. And if we start pissing people off and sour our relationship, all the good work we've already done might go out the window. So it, I absolutely think we need to address this. I just want to make sure we don't address it in a way that takes away all the good work we've already done. Uh, well, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate what you're saying, but if, our, if somebody from RMA yeah. is watching this, you know, right now and wants to know what I think, you know, there's no friggin' way I want a single 737 on a regular scheduled uh, commercial flight coming over our town, and we'll work to rally the citizens to make sure that never happens. And, and so, and that's fine. I just want to make sure that it, uh, yeah. So, and I just don't, you know, the hey, it's a commercial. It's a charter flight, it's, you know, Washington football coming in, like, whatever, you know, we, we could deal. It's just different once it's scheduled, you know. Right. Oh, you know, you'll, you know, we can't have dinner at, at 6 o'clock because, uh, you know, we got to wait for the, uh, you know, the 6.03 to arrive, and then we'll sit down at the table. That's, that's just not the good thing. Ken, I agree with what you're saying. I think to not do something because we're afraid of the consequences, Problematic. Agreed. Mm -hmm. It was just the timing. Yeah, so no, I, I think our, our consultants should do everything they should, <laughs> or, and we should not feel worried that we right. engage with them on the, on the commercial front. Because if, if what the consultants are doing gets thrown out the window because the airport feels threatened and they feel retaliatory, retaliatory, I think that's a, that, it's a whole different problem. But I don't disagree that that's it's definitely something we should be concerned about. Yep. And I guess, Matt, um, it's been, what, six weeks since we approved the consultant? Have we, or do we have an update at all? Um, I thought I included one in the digest, but my plan okay, was to have them at the meeting okay. and the, this the airport director that. Oh, so. okay. No, that's great. Okay, two birds with one stone. Awesome. One other meeting question that's semi-related. I know Clint had forwarded the FAA uh, Metroplex workshop <laughs> site. Yeah. Workshops for the Denver Metroplex project. So again, I'd ask, do we do we want to make sure we have someone go to one of those? So, I mean, Clint and I attended a Metroplex meeting back in December. Metroplex is a very different prospect. It's, it's a DIA effort, mm -hmm. you know, and it's engaged yeah. the FAA. And Not they are so far, yeah. They're so far down the path here. Um, I mean, everybody's welcome to attend the meetings. I just don't know 
the FAA is doing what they can. This is about managing traffic in and out of DIA. Okay. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Just making sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good one. Metroplex is a, is a big, big project. Okay. The issue is for DIA, I think they're already 90% complete, you know, relative to some of the other airports. So, you know, one <laughs> With flight paths or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's about managing some of the inbound and outbound for DIA. Okay. I thought you meant build out and I was like, no, no, not. Not flight yeah. <laughs> Okay. I kind of viewed, because the meeting we attended in December, <laughs> Metroplex is, is you know, a net good thing for the airport, for DIA, mm -hmm. but the impact to Boulder County is rounding error. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Unfortunately, and it's funny, because in that meeting, you know, when we brought up the noise issue, they sort of said, yeah, those turbo props, we can't do anything about those, or those training planes, we can't do anything about that, which... Preferences on, uh, I'm just going to go down the list, Neil, that you provided uh, or suggested uh, affordable housing position plan approach next. Good with that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And this, yeah, this item, um, it's kind of a follow up to what we heard from the county at the presentation at last month um, and you know, we also have a new board seated and, and so we I guess the question is you know do we as a board want to actively pursue working with them to get some type of housing we are we're one of the only communities in the county that has zero um, in, in terms of housing numbers and and we also have relatively a uh, small number of options for where yeah, to, and that's to the, build I, and that's the, actually well i this is such a problem and you can highlight and i hate that that you know two is highlighted <laughs> it's you know we are a planned community and we, nobody sitting at this table will effectively plan the community, right? So when the community was planned, there was no affordable housing that was... There, there wasn't, and there probably wasn't in a lot of the communities that, right. that have since built them. So you can, you have plans that were created, but you can change plans and you can make new plans. And that's the question is, do we want to do that? I mean, there, are, there are opportunities in the marketplace at the, uh, at the RTD, um, park and ride site that has been discussed that is a little bit challenging because it involves structure parking which drives price up and it, it kind of becomes um, you know a little bit more challenging a number unless that parking can be somehow um, or, or that housing anyway this, when you start structuring parking it gets, you, you, it gets expensive mm -hmm. real quick and so that's that's one of the challenges there. But from a close to mobility, that that score is very high. So that that facility could could and should be definitely part of a discussion, a micro unit or something. But the, so but the bigger question is does the, does this community and does this board have the tolerance to go through those discussions with residents to to support something? like that over there then we've got some chunks in original town that are zoned medium and and could could be something else if it were developed in uh, you know more than a block you know house by house and we uh, so I, I think that's that's really you know we've, we've really got very few but we do have some sites so I, I think to say uh, we're Sorry guys, we can't do anything, we're full. No, we're not full. We've got stuff behind, um, we've got, uh, yeah, there's, there's properties behind um, Costco, 76th Street that could get annexed, it could. So there are, there are a couple of, of opportunity sites. I think the other piece that's related to this though is not just thinking about sites where you build 
something with 27 units. I mean, when I started going out and sort of, I was reading the CML publication on affordable housing, and there are other ways to crack this nut than building a property. You know, there are way, I think it was, it was one of the mountain communities actually took some of their um, funds and then, and it sounds like this is what Boulder County would do is that you can put some deed restrictions on existing properties. You know, I'd have to agree to do it on my property. And so for me, uh, I mean, A, I think this is a massive problem. I think B, we think we're gonna solve it by building something and tearing down a building in original town or, you know, we're gonna come in and say all of a sudden this community is affordable housing. Well, what we really need to do is sit down with Boulder County and talk about what are the in ingenious ways that you can tackle this problem in your community that are not traditionally you go, because we aren't gonna get a builder to build affordable housing in this community because they're making too darn much money building high-end townhouses. So, you know, I would really like to see us sit down with Boulder County, you know, if it's a couple of board members and a couple of staff members or some interesting people, to really talk to them about what are some of the creative ways we might be able to address this problem. And, you know, I was intrigued when I heard um, the, uh, I can't remember his name now, the gentleman say that there are, there are funds that are available to help convert housing so that people can age in place. You know, one of the things I think about with my townhouse is when I get to be 85 years old, I probably won't be able to go up the incredibly steep steps in my house. But there might be a way that Boulder County would help me convert my unit, and then when it's sold, it would then be appropriate for an older citizen. And are there tax incentives to encourage me to do that to my unit? So um, I, I didn't, you know, I really appreciated Lisa Ritchie's comments that we have got to not be the person on the map that's doing nothing to address this problem. And I would really like to see us sit down and have a serious conversation so, with Boulder County so Sandy, about ingenious ways we might be able to address so this. So four years ago, Rita and I did sit down with Frank Alexander. I mean, we have sat down with him. Right. Okay. We've had, and we've had just, multiple yeah. conversations with him. And there is interest in building in Superior. They, they came to me when I was first elected in 2014 and said, we want to we would like some sites to build. So, so I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, the the private housing approach, but they do want to build something and more than a one, one or two unit thing. They do want to build something. They have the money for it. They have builders that will do it because they've got the financing structure figured out. They just don't have sites. And we do have sites, but do we have the political will? That... I, and I, we can kind of dance around that all we want, but do we, do we as a board, and, and this is not too unlike um, the home rule discussion, because you know we, we really, I mean, we, we signed on to that county thing saying, yep, we're, we're on board with you. You know, the other day, Mayor Boulder says, so what are y'all doing? You know, you signed this nice document, but what are y'all doing? <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, I haven't done anything yet. Well, hold on, so that we signed it. Let's remember it's a regional goal. And there are other communities that are not supportive of the regional goal. So we signed on to a regional goal, which is a big deal. So let's not undermine. Let's not, you know, what are we doing? We supported the regional goal, right? Which is... Which you know, is each community does something. No, that's not what the regional goal is. So let's be careful that the, it does not... Re, the, the regional goal does not mean that the town of Superior is, and if the regional goal are, it's somewhere in here, is going, it's basically tripling or doubling the housing from 6,000, I think, to 18,000 or something. It was that slide right there. The one up, the one above. Oh, below. From, right, from six to, to 18,000, right, uh, was basically, is the regional goal. But the, my understanding of the regional goal is not that the town of Superior is gonna contribute 
you know, 50, and Longmont's going to contribute 62, and they totaled it up that way, right? It is a regional goal. We, we purposely carved that out so that we weren't locked into something. I, I, I understand, but there's others yeah. that are, there are other communities that were less supportive of even the regional goal. So, but I get we're getting our feet held to the fire a little bit, you know, what are you going to do from a land perspective if there is a, you know, if, if there is a proposal from them to secure land, I'd like to hear what that proposal is. To my knowledge, we haven't, they haven't in my tenure come and said, I'd like to secure the land next to, uh, I, I, I no, they haven't, right. but they also need to hear that there's the political will. They don't have the time or the energy to go down paths only to get turned down by a board. So if there isn't the political will, they're not going to get to an LOI on a property because they don't have, they, it's not going to go anywhere on the back end. So I think there's, um, there's kind of two questions here that we're talking about there's the general support for yes. you know what we heard at, at the, the last meeting um you know potential sales tax potential, potential mill levy um whether it's 2019 oh, 2020 right. and you know what is our position going to be as a board uh, in terms of encouraging the voters to support the countywide uh ballot measure whenever that comes and then second secondly there's specific execution of you know, bringing units, affordable housing units, um, to Superior, and you know, how how exactly do you go about you know solving that problem? On that issue, um, the, the site that you know makes I think all the sense in the world is the RTV site next to the park and ride, next to you know Whole Foods over there that it's owned by RTD. You could do transit oriented you know development there next to the marketplace. Um, you know, obviously this is RTD's property, so you know, we're gonna need to get them on board with it, but you know, that seems to me a logical place to put something that is gonna be you know, affordable. It's gonna be something where you don't need to have a car. You'll have access to, to buses that take you into Boulder, take you into Denver, um, and you have access to you know, all the amenities of the marketplace, and you're, you're not gonna be too far away from, from downtown Superior. So it, that, you know, that site is just, Seems like okay. That that's one that we're talking about that totally could work, right? And, and there's a lot of other sites that you know, they're they're owned by private parties right now, and we need to you know, get them on board. You know, we don't have the ability to, to force anybody's hand. Um, but you know, if if we're looking to actually like execute on this, I think what we need to do is identify. You know, these are the the properties that make the most sense, and you know, these are the owners of those properties. And these are the things that we can bring to the table as a town, and these are the things that we need to owners to get on board with but you know I don't know how many how many units we could fit on that property but that that to me option that is like concrete and identifiable and actually could work and I think RTD would actually get on board with it they have a whole unit that is that is uh, that does transit oriented development I mean they are they are on board with it um, Boulder County's on board with it I think the question is are we on board with it so, I mean, from my perspective, and I like the summary, Mark, because, you know, if it's supporting, you know, by a resolution, town board support, you know, the tax measures, I'm all on board on that. If it's, do we support, you know, um, affordable housing in the town, I'm all on board on that. Do I care where it is? No, I want them to bring us proposed locations. I don't want to be prescriptive about, no, it can go here, here, not here. Um, I want us as a board to say that we are committed to affordable housing and let BCHRMP figure out where it makes sense. Because we, if we start saying it's okay here, but not here, here, or here, um, we're gonna shoot ourselves in the foot. You know, if we truly commit to affordable housing, let's let you know, BCH or HP you know, isolate what works that for them and leave it open. But if, we, if we're gonna just pigeonhole it to a certain part of town where this is allowable, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice in trying to make this successful. I, I agree with that, but I think we, Beyond, I think we need to take a little step beyond just saying uh, we support affordable housing. I mean, that's a pretty easy thing to say. Um, I, I think the most, I think we should have an opinion as a board on, on this, you know, this one particular site sure. because it is the most 
I think, viable in terms of checking off most of the boxes and it could be, you know, it, it is probably the easiest one to make happen. So if we consider that a viable <laughs> property, um, then does that mean that we take the leadership on trying to find somebody to develop it? Do we say, okay, we support it, but somebody else has got to build? I mean, I have to be honest, the fact that you and Rita had a meeting with the affordable housing folks, I literally don't remember. If it was when I was on the board, I don't remember any conversation about it. Yeah, it so I'm not saying that, yeah, you know, it's not accusing you or anything. It's just like literally yeah. not in my brain. Yeah. So. No, this was 14 or. Uh, okay, so it was before our time. This was in 2015. Okay, and, yeah. and in 2014, the demand for housing was very different than it, it is, it is sure. now. So for our residents, they may be more open to it than they've been in the past because they may have, teen, you know, children who are trying to be here and they can't afford it because, I mean, right. so, I, you know, I for one am absolutely open to whatever the next step is. And if it's sitting down with Boulder County and RTD and having the conversation, I mean, we don't have a lot of land here, but if there are spaces, that those um, organizations believe would be viable, in addition, you know, the BRT or wherever it would happen to be. Um, I really want to hear that in a more formal way from those bodies, because then that makes it easier for me to say, yep, I'm on board. Yeah. Um, well, to answer your question about who takes the lead on this, they take the lead on this. Yeah. Boulder County Housing Partners, that, that's what they do. But we have to say, yes, we're supportive of you coming in and yes. doing it. Yes. And I think that's the, I mean, there were other reasons that that, that there, there were some economic reasons and, and other reasons that it didn't move beyond in 2015. But I, I also sensed, my sense of, was that there may not have been enough support board-wise. You, you've got to have that. And they know they've got to have You know, again, I'll say, I think the world was very different in 2014 as far as needing affordable, and, and this is not low cost, this is affordable housing um, in the entire Denver metropolitan area. And so I, sure. I don't know that, you know, maybe we've got to have some outreach with the community on this topic to really find out what is that? I mean, I think we're maybe making an assumption. How do our residents feel about it? And we don't really have any idea whether they are opposed, not opposed. Um, you know, I, obviously this is a sensitive issue for me because of where I work um, and the types of folks we deal with every day. But, um, you know, I, I would personally like to see us move forward Whatever way, if if we think we should as a board, but I would like to see us move forward and be more proactive in this area. Okay. And I think as a so the next step may be to do what Nettleman did, which is you know some community engagement. Right? Or not. You know, our our residents. You know, there's this little uh, postcard. You know, has got it up on the slide. You know, I support. Affordable rents. I agree. Business employees, families, seniors need uh, more housing in order to continue living here. I believe the emergency responders should be able to live in the community they serve. I believe the teacher, people who teach our children to be able to live here. And I mean, I think that's a you know, if you can anchor to four things, this is sort of the slow roll message of the sales process. You know, building is not going to start tomorrow, but we do want to start engaging the community, making sure we have support from the community. We do want to start uh, the potential property acquisition, or at least thinking about what, the, what that property acquisition is. And I think this is you know, maybe a different board than we had previously. I, it sounds like there is a bit of an appetite to, to try to go after this. And that doesn't mean it's a firm commitment that we're going to make it happen, but it's, it's important. I think the only thing I would add is I don't want us to just focus in on 
with RTD parcel. Right. I, I do think 76th Street parcel, that's still well within uh, walking distance, biking distance to RTD. Uh, we have the path that's going in right there. That's still a really good candidate for last mile yes. uh, access. Uh, so the, just to make sure that we don't get too I, focused. I, I totally agree. I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't want to get so tunnel vision on this either. I, I think um, uh, multiple options, but I, I just, I wanted to come away from this topic with a, a sense from the board of, do we have a, a general leaning towards, yes, we'd be interested in talking about this versus the other end of the spectrum, which is that's someone else's problem, let them deal with it, which I kind of feel like is that, has been the message that I've heard in the past, not from this board, but I've heard that in the past. Well, the, the past boards, I mean, I remember very clearly the one of the opinions that was raised was Superior is the affordable housing to Boulder, right? And it was, we are already affordable, comparatively speaking, and so therefore there is no problem to solve because we've already done our part because we're not as expensive as Boulder. Um, but I think, you know, practically speaking, you know, there is, you know, we're only four square miles. We, you know, Rock Creek's built out, Cal, Cal Monte is built out. We've got very, you know, few available <coughs> lots that, you know, could potentially, you know, work, right? Town Center is going to be built out. Um, you know, Anderson's already approved. We've got the Resolute property um, that is basically got plans on it already. and. Um, Rogers Farm is is already being built. So I mean, we are very quickly running out of right. any available space. I mean, right. So, right. So the five strategies, the securing the land is something, or the six strategies, securing the land is something that we could do. But I have I have a big appetite for something like that. I personally have it from a regulatory process. You know, there are communities that have changed the regulation to say, you know, for every hundred you know you'll you'll build ten affordable houses for every hundred. My sense is I, I would be a lot less supportive of something like that. I still might need to learn and be convinced, but my instincts tell me that it's not something that I personally would get around. And I would I would agree with that too. I, I think uh, yeah, I think that ship has almost sailed right. uh, in our in our case. Right. I mean if we were starting anew, yeah that might make sense. But I think where we are now it's about, okay, are there selective sites where this makes sense, particularly those near transit? We've got very good transit connectivity in this town, and well, at least the northern part of the town uh, for the most part. And, and that should be, we should take advantage of that. If there are okay. things we can do, though, I mean, there's, there's some good pieces here. I mean, expedited plan reviews. I mean, if there's even the tiniest things, whether they make a difference or not, if we put it in there, who knows, maybe there's a developer that sees that and jumps on. So if there's things we can do from a policy perspective. Yep. Well, and there's one on there, you know, adoption of the ADU ordinance, which goes back to the uh, original town yeah. discussions. I think, you know, also, you know, for the benefit of the marketplace, and we've been talking about kind of solving, you know, trying to reconfigure the marketplace. I mean, if we can get some some people who live over there. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. We need the foot traffic and, and pedestrians that are going to be walking to Target and walking to Whole Foods and Costco and, and able to you know, do their shopping locally. And you know, that's going to really benefit the marketplace. They're going to have people who work there, who shop there, who live there. I mean, it's. You know, and, and frankly, you know, one of the things that we talked about with Bricksmore was, you know, I forget who, who I kind of identified the, the area where uh, Office Max, and, and they said that you know that was one of the kind of smaller big boxes that potentially could be converted into something in the future. So you know that that's another thing that we look at. It's like you know as part of the overall solving of you know, the problem that is the marketplace. Is there an affordable housing component? Because right now, if we're looking at vacant lots, you know there are a few, there are few and far between. But there's a lot of pavement in, and 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 empty boxes at the marketplace that potentially could be converted into residential. And, and that's why I don't want to be too prescriptive with this and just say you know right over by RTD. I think there's flexibility within sure. the town. I think you know, 
these guys do this for a living, they can probably look at our town and say, hey, we can work with the developers here, here, and here. And I think that, you know, I think that, that speaks volumes. If they can approach the town and sort of say, hey, you build out all the vacant land, but here's how we can help with redeveloping some areas or utilizing some areas that are underutilized. Okay. Because I think there's probably more flexibility than we can think on our own. Yeah. Okay. Well, this, I think this is a helpful discussion. Do we want to weigh in on the this uh, property tax or this tax question that, was, that you mentioned and, and that was discussed at the presentation? Do we? Uh, what was the test? It sounds like their thinking is 2020 now, so we have some time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do we want to support? Oh, the, the I think once ballot measures. Once they yep. solidify okay. that they're going to the ballot and they, they know what it's okay. going to be, then yeah. all right, so maybe we don't get into that. Yeah, okay. I'd be more comfortable right. as they have it defined. All right, fair. Okay, anything else on this topic? Okay. We have two more, and we're doing good here. Well, one is and other. So other. <laughs> other. So I, I have another topic. That's always <laughs> the, too excited about it. It's always the wild card. <laughs> I have another iPhone. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Right. Well, we got till 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, comprehensive plan update, long range plan. So I, yeah, I asked Matt to throw that one on. Uh, for the most part, that was a follow-up from our last retreat. I think it was Laura and I were supportive of wanting to do an update to the comp plan or at least do something with that document to bring it more up to date uh, and, and more valuable. Um, personally, and, and really, so what I was trying to do with this was just get the pulse of the board to see if it's worth it to talk about a budgeting scenario for it for 2020. Uh, and just see where everyone landed. Um, as I was moving forward and looking at this and, and trying to figure out what makes the most sense, I also had a, a a very different random thought that I thought I'd at least throw it out to everybody. Um, there's a lot of things that we want resident feedback on right now. Uh, housing, uh, Town 15 has come up, uh, rec center has come up. We have a ton of things that if we had a document that could tell us a whole lot of just where our residents stand that could potentially be way more useful for long-term planning than an update to the comp plan uh mm -hmm. something similar to a census that happens to be going on next year if we were to go on to that and create some type of uh survey or product similar to a census but rather than try and get demographic information put out very specific things uh for example is there appetite for a library? If so, would you be willing to increase your property taxes by one mill? Start, this would have a lot of thought behind it beyond what I'm saying right now, but a different type of planning document to get us to where our future decisions would be supported by our present feedback. So completely out there, bring it up. It's your people hand. I'm generally in favor of updating. I mean, as I was flipping through it, there's a lot of pages we could just delete. You know, like, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't even pertain here. But, you know, it's a 2012 plan. ProStax plan is 2005. So we've got some really old plans out there that all need, for lack of a better term, a comprehensive update. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I'm all in favor of updating these things because, you know, from when they were written to where we are today, a lot of things have changed, a lot of things are going to change. They're all living documents. It's just a question of which one goes first cost of doing it. Yeah. What else we could glom onto? <coughs> I, I definitely think a comprehensive plan update is important. After speaking with Matt more about it, um, I, I would definitely agree with his view. I don't think we necessarily need to publish an entirely new mm -hmm. plan, but more of an addendum packet of, hey, the 2019 update, we are keeping this section, we are changing this section, etc. Um, just as Ken pointed out, to kind of bring the cost down, leave room for other initiatives. Um, I think to his point, we've got a lot we want to we want to figure out from a planning perspective. I like the idea of updating the plan. It's um, it is something that people ask about and, and people uh, use as a reference document. So to have a 2012 as our most uh, current version, uh, we, we're definitely behind on that. So I, I think from that perspective alone, we need to have an updated document. I, th I think the selective approach, I'd be in favor of that. I like the idea of a community-wide survey as well. You know, we did, uh, we've done those in the past and they get uh, referred 
to a lot, and so I think there is a lot of mileage that can come out of those, and, and with the improvements in, in technology and, and the ability to reach people <coughs> on their phones, I mean, to, to you know, have this be something that people could do on their phone and, and click through, I think we, we should hope to get a very high response rate and, and really have some useful information. Um, we just need to put a lot of care into yes. into how questions are drafted and, and what they're trying to get at because I, the, the last thing we want is what I've seen in past surveys is, is things get discounted because they didn't like the they didn't like the way the questions were written so it's all garbage you know that that to me is to, let's not go there let's let's uh, let's make sure we've got it right and then uh, and then push it out and uh, I think the more information we can get like that, the better. I, it's, I almost wondered, I agree with everything you said. I just want to be careful about the digital engagement versus the in-person engagement. I think there's something as important as this, that it's not just a digital engagement. There's something about in-person that's going to just differently involve the community. And the last time we did it, you know, there were, you know, I love the pictures just going through the plan of the community coming in and looking at, at uh, you know, at, at the boards and engaged. I just want to make sure that just because we have devices in our hand doesn't mean we... No, I, I was speaking more to his, sur to his survey I'm idea. I was speaking about that, the survey as well. I think okay. the survey, I want to make sure that we're also doing some in-person. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. So, but, uh, but what's the, you know, are we looking at this to budget for next year? I mean, this is, I wouldn't say it's long overdue, but it's definitely, it's due, right? right? I mean, Appendix B is Town Center Plan Development, and there's nothing there, because <laughs> and that yet to be approved, it was in the planning stage, but there is no Appendix B. I mean, that is a considerable change in, you know, what our town is dealing with now, so I mean, we need to have a comprehensive plan that actually reflects downtown superior. So, yeah, no, I'm... I'm 100% on board with updating the comp plan. Um, I this is going to be a big, a big task. It's going to take a lot of time. So uh, I think the only thing that we need to just be mindful of is you know, there are only so many hours in the day, yep. and you know, when we do a comp plan update, that's going to be taking away our time. It's going to be taking away staff's time. It's going to be directing resources. Uh, so we just need to make sure that there aren't other priorities that we feel we need to be spending our time on instead of a compliment. And I'm not su suggesting that there are, but we should just at least be mindful that if we're going to be, you know, this is not something that we can just do lightly. You know, when we're going down this path, we gotta be all in and, and make sure that we've got the resources and time that we're gonna spend on this. So, uh, generally I'm supportive. I just want to make sure that everybody's you know, appropriately <coughs> prioritizing this over potentially other things that we'll be spending our time on. That'd be a good discussion at yeah. the budget time to find out what are those priorities right. and the opportunity costs we're not doing. Right. Like last year, we spent a lot of time discussing a potential rec center, right? And yeah. That was a lot of staff time dealing with designs and going back to the drawing board and changing those designs and I'm not saying that was good or bad but it was just a lot of time and you know, there's only so many hours in the day so we just need to make sure that if this is what we're going to be prioritizing this is what we're prioritizing. Would we bring in consultants to help do this or would this all be staff? We, yeah, we would have to bring in a consultant. And that's the largest portion of what the budget goes towards. How much did the comp plan update cost in 2012, you know? It was at least 150000 150 to 200000 I think. Lafayette's. 180, Martin says. <laughs> and Lafayette's, didn't they just do a contract this past year for doing a comp, comp plan update for themselves as well? There's a process of it. I bet that's probably a better benchmark also for too much their spending. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> we'll over time it. And presumably ours would be less if we're updating sections rather than yeah. yeah. Wouldn't be all yeah. okay. okay. All right, good. All right. Review of outreach.
outreach channels, Reddit, Google groups. I think it's interesting that the most popular subreddit was Lorenai's discussion about the library. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I, I will kick this off and kind of want to echo what Mark just said about the comp plan. Um, if we go for the comp plan, we need to go all in on it. I think that's kind of been the miss here with Google Groups and Reddit. Not saying we, not saying we did anything wrong, but I think we launched it and we kind of put it out there, and there weren't really any discussions in it. So of course it didn't take off. Um, I don't feel strongly one way or the other whether we now make a big push to make them successful or whether we drop them entirely. I'd be curious to hear what the rest of the board thinks, but I think they've not grown organically, which really isn't a surprise. Just out of curiosity. What do we do different? I think we all, I'm seeing so, I think 90% of the posts are us. They are. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, um, I, I think it would be pushing them on, pushing them on our official Facebook pages. Um, I think the challenge, I would say having discussion, but we can't have discussion with each other on there. So that's not an option. Um, but, or just word of mouth saying, you know, tell five friends, hey, can you guys go start some good discussion there? Again, not saying that's the direction I think we should go, but yeah. I think that's what it would take for them to be successful. I mean, I signed up, figured it out, and then realized that it wasn't, you know, you know, okay, millennials will say email's dead, but it's still, sir, it's still presented right to my computer every day. Yep. You know, I will occasionally kill time with Facebook and go on the 0027 or Superior website. Those are the mediums that I choose. The Reddit and Google Groups just didn't work. I think with um, with Google Groups, the only thing I would put out there is, I mean, that is also an email forum, but I think the only way we would get people to switch to Google Groups is if we shut down the CAC and said you have to migrate to Google Groups. There's Otherwise, there's no reason for someone to move from one email listserv to another, especially when, I mean, people keep doing what they're doing. So. Yeah, we have a creative, compelling reason to go to the other platforms. Exactly. And again, not saying we need to create that reason, but... It's, it seems to me also the, that the CAC itself is dying. And, like, there's a... I, I'm getting way less in terms yes. of, you know, emails on the CAC. So, like, I don't know if it's just people are happy right now and there's nothing to, to complain about on the CAC. <laughs> but it just seems like we should jump Wait a minute, really? Yeah. That's what you think? <laughs> wait wait for the next election <laughs> cycle. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. it, it's just, it, it doesn't seem like there is like the volume. And then it seems like where the, the traffic is, it's on like the, the Facebook groups. It's on yeah. the 027, it's on the Superior Community Group. Yeah. That's where there's activity. Every now and then, maybe there's next door, but I feel like that's kind of a very small subset of the population. So I think like the most impact is still, you know, on, the, on, on Facebook, and and then there's just a lot of people who they're busy living their lives and they're not they're not yeah. interacting on the CAC and they're not interacting on Reddit and they're not interacting on Google groups and there's probably nothing that we're going to do that's going to change that, right? I think we just haven't had anything controversial in a few months. You know, I think people get wild up when there's something big coming, and it's been kind of a quiet couple of months. Mm, that's true. Um, which is not, I mean, you know, we haven't had a concept plan or rather an FDP in a couple of months. Uh, oil and gas got quiet. Um, but I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe everything's just transitioning away from the CAC already. I think people settled into what works for them. I'm kind of like Kevin. I, I've got my comfort level with Facebook and the Facebook <laughs> groups. I signed up for Google Groups. I signed up for Reddit. I spent my quota of time trying to figure it out and make it work for me. And I just, I haven't logged in since. And, and I'm just, I just don't plan to. Um, I, I'm very similar in, in my engagement. I figured out how to comment as a page now and I feel great about that and, and I, you know from, so like life is you know life is good and you know if that's where the if that's where the people are hanging out you know that's where we need to be hanging out um, and I think it's great that we tried these different avenues because if we hadn't tried them we wouldn't have known you know we'd always be asking if there were I think the CAC is is uh, you know 
its, its relevance. Is, I think people are transitioning to the Facebook platform because you can put pictures up, because you can, you know, it's just, it's more dynamic, it's more um, user-friendly, it's, it's not 20-year-old technology. CAC is 20-year-old technology. Yeah, the downside of the CAC is, you know, there's no proof of identity, and there's no pictures that can be attached. Yep. So I think people are a bit dismissive of because there's no proof of identity, you don't know who somebody, there's no identity solution there. Right. And then on the pictures, you know, people are just going elsewhere for the lost dog, and I don't think it's really our right. problem to solve for the lost dog. I think their lost dogs are showing up on Facebook, so. That's a good point. Half the CAC posts are, oh, did you check the Facebook yeah. post about the lost dog? <laughs> So I, I think it was a good experiment. I don't think we, there's nothing to quote shut down. It's the problem is this. once you set it, it's probably just. It just stays. It just mm -hmm. stays. Yeah. Right. But it's an archive. I think we've made leaps and bounds. So in right. terms of town wide, um, the, you know, the weekly, I think the e, the e blast, um, relevance i think has has risen i mean the quality of the of the monthly sentinel newsletter is is the content is excellent it's got um it's, it's got everything people need and and then this weekly meeting recap and, and the enhancements that, we, that uh, sandy brought in the idea about the development summary i mean so we've we've really done a lot to um, engage and be transparent. So yes, we are transparent beyond belief. And uh, so I, I think, yeah, in, in terms of the review, okay, good experiment. Let it sit there. Maybe it, you know, maybe it uh, grows and you know, maybe it catches on. And uh, I, I think it's it's good to have the channels. And we'll see where it goes over time. I guess. Well, somebody could start something really controversial. <laughs> Maybe that would. I was just going to say, we could park a bulldozer on the town 15. <laughs> <laughs> See what that there is. There you go. Coming with a big coming soon sign. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I think having them out there, we just haven't really had anything that has generated a lot of con conversation and yeah. leave them out there. And yeah. if it ends up that something comes up that we really need a lot of feedback on, we go out there and. Post it on both of them and see what happens. Okay. All right. We're on to other. So I've got one one other, and so I sent an email out to everybody. Uh, you know, I reached out to the Wolfpack Ninjas. I wanted to see what the board thought about actually bringing a an event <coughs> like that to Superior. We could do it either at the marketplace, assuming that um, you know, Bricksmore would, would be on board with that. We could. Uh, Clint and I, we drove up to Longmont today, we passed the village of the peaks, I kind of pointed out where my family attended that event, and, you know, they set up a whole, like, pro course, they got the professional ninjas, but then the kids can do it, um, and usually... Can adults do it, too? Uh, I think the adults can sign up, I mean, usually <laughs> with, with, they said that, you know, when I talked to them, uh, they had 5,000 people go through the, the Longmont course over the course of two days, um, wow. now what they try to do, they try to limit it to 1,000 people per day, so they don't just get like inundated and usually they have people sign up for like a two hour window mm -hmm. and so they can kind of control the control the flow um but it's you know a great um family friendly event you know we have we've got obviously the fourth of july parade we've got chili fest um you know we've got our movies in the park and this is just kind of like a potential additional event it's not inexpensive you know, fifty thousand dollars for a two-day event um, but in talking to the people behind um, this organization, uh, they said that you know one way to defray the cost would be to you know, kind of work with the local chamber of commerce and sell you know, sponsorships for local businesses. Um, sometimes they'll sponsor it. Sometimes you know they'll sell ads. You know things like that. Um, or alternatively, you know you can also charge admission if you wanted to do it like that. Some some towns just say this is a cool event that we're doing. We want to encourage you know, young kids to get off their screens and get active and run around and act like ninjas. So um, I just wanted to know what the appetite was on the board, if this is something that we're interested in, 
um, I'm happy to continue the conversation with them. We can start looking at some dates. Obviously, we need to budget for um, an event like this. But if there is an appetite for it, then it was just my own curiosity. Uh, and we'll just leave it at that. I'd be very interested in this. Um, I met today with our economic development consultant, and one of the things I shared with him is that, particularly as as the Superior Town Center grows, I would really like to see us have more events in the town. I think they help bring people in, bring people to those businesses. Um, and I think today our CAPS committee does a fantastic job um, planning events around cultural arts. And But I would love to see more events like exactly the one Mark is proposing. And I'd like for us to figure out where, where within the town those fall as far as the responsibility. And, is it the CAPS committee that should help with the planning for something like this? Or who would, or is it ProStock because they take place in the parks, not this one, but. I think, I, I just, so I think, first, thanks, I think it's a cool idea. Um, I haven't personally, you know, I've seen the TV show, but I haven't seen the breakout things. I did click through the website, and it sounds like it's pretty cool. Um, I would just want to make sure that I, I'm supportive. I just want to couple it with something, right? So it's either coupled with, because we have a lot going on, can we couple it with the main event, you know, one of the main events that CAPS is doing, you know, somehow mm -hmm. piggyback on that. Do we make, I, I don't, I know we don't contribute to the Morgo anymore. At least I don't think we did this year, but is the, I don't even know if the Morgo is still happening. Can we do, you know, do we want to do it? During the morgue, we try to get improved, you know, branding for the town. Do we do it? Do we go to the ranch capital folks and say, you know, listen, once you have, you know, let's do an open house weekend and you can bring in all your builders and we'll pay half and you pay half. I, I just want to, I think it's a great idea. I just want to, it's, as a standalone, I like it more coupled with something than I do as a standalone. I think as a standalone, it's a really good idea. When it's coupled with something else, it's awesome. And gets, for me, prioritized even, you know, we find money this year, as opposed to, you know, having a conversation next year. Because I think it's a really good idea. And, you know, the kids obviously love it. So, yeah, I like, I appreciate you bringing it as an idea too. Um, I think for, you know, for teens, it really checks off a lot of boxes for them. And we constantly hear, you know, more for the teens, more for right. the teens to do it. So it, it could really be, I mean, not only for them to participate in it, but to um, probably engage and work with it on the setup and the staffing and takedown. I, I don't know, but that, that's, I think it has a lot of um, potential there. I like the idea of coupling it with, uh, I, I think it totally makes sense on the, on the first, and, you know, if it's successful with subsequent events, uh, maybe it becomes big enough to peel it off and do it on its own. but. You know, to me, it feels like a, a good springtime, early summertime event because we've got mm -hmm. we've got fourth in the middle, and we got the chili fest in the fall, and, and you know, you definitely want to do it during the not during winter. So it yeah. kind of leaves. Um, yeah, the problem with the spring is it's <laughs> it's, it's like right. Arbor Day. Yeah, it's going to start raining every day yeah. between four and six. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. And it could snow. Right. <laughs> you know, as it has. Um, I, I really like the idea, but the, the main reason I like the idea was it's got this showcase event, but it has a, it, it must have a significant um, opportunity for our local residents yeah. to participate. I think when we did the Morgul, many, I mean, I was one of the volunteers on the initial Morgul, and we had great aspirations about what it would be and that we'd have booths and tents and things, but it really wasn't a way for residents to become engaged in what the activity was. You know, we couldn't we couldn't all ride the morgue. We could volunteer, but we couldn't be significantly engaged in what that activity was. So that's the piece that intrigued me is that we could have a thousand young people, probably not sixty year olds doing the ninja thing, but that to me is the only way that to me it is worth doing is that we would have significant opportunity for engagement by our residents and participate in, if, you know, it's gonna be a big ninja event, um, 
but it doesn't have a lot of involvement of our residents. I'm not interested. But if indeed our residents have the opportunity to participate and be a part of it, then I think it's it's worth <coughs> um, But I really focus in too on what Kevin said is you know we're going to be trying to pull off a bunch of events through caps, and I don't <coughs> want to see us lose our vision on what's going to be happening with caps by trying to pull this off too. So let's just make sure we don't in any way diminish those efforts or, you know, I mean, we only have so many staff. Um, so that would be my only other concern is trying to pull it off quickly and not having the resources to do it. They, they need a, you know, typically like a four month, you know, window in terms of booking. So, you know, as a practical matter, it's probably not going to happen this year. Yeah, and if it did, it would be, you'd be looking at September or October. Um, so it, it may not be in the cards for this year, but it's one of those things that we do have a pretty big place. They could do it in George too. And that's the other thing. I mean, we could do it at the sports day. True. I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, the cool thing is you drive by and you're outside, but it was, you know, that's another option. Too. Yeah. So I mean, when I was talking to them, uh, like last week or two weeks ago, um, so that they, they had this one up in Longmont. They're doing one in, in Loveland, um, I think a couple weeks, and Loveland's actually paying for that one. The one up in Longmont was uh, paid for by the Village of the Peaks Mall. And, you know, the purpose of that was basically, I mean, that's a that's a brand new mall, and they want to drive traffic to that mall, get people there. And, and they said that, you know, they have people coming from, you know, all across the state, all across the nation, basically. They have people flying in from like San Diego to go do it, and, you know, people are really into this. Um, I agree with Cindy. Like, if, if we're going to be paying for this, you know, I want it open to our residents, you know, first. And you know, every kid in Superior that wants to go run the ninja course should be able to run the ninja course. And if there's, you know, overflow for people from, you know, the the area, because I, I do think that there is, you know, the economic belt benefit uh, to you know, getting people into the marketplace. Um, although there is, you know, an impact too, is you know, if there's, you know, traffic, you know, there, there would be people that, you know, may not be shopping at Costco or at Target that day because they're say there's too much traffic. Um, you know, so it's certainly something that we want to be mindful of you know, the existing tenants there and work with bricks more and, and make sure that you know, they're okay with it. But if we can't do it there, you know, we could probably do it in the community park and parking lot there or, you know, I don't know, elsewhere, maybe Safeway parking lot or something. I don't know. But maybe Land Rover. I, you know, who knows? Um, but it, it, it just seems like this is something you know, we, we've been talking about it with, with CAPS about trying to find, like, our identity as a town, right? And, like, doing these things that are, you know, cool, right? And painting crosswalks and, and you know, installing prairie dog, you know, art and, and doing these kind of art installations and, you know, having really unique sculptures and public art. And, you know, this, to me, is just, like, another thing that could help kind of, like, define our community. Like, what a cool town. They sponsor a ninja event for, for teens, you know, like, and it's something that's a positive, you know, you're encouraging people to, you know, get off their couches and, you know, be active and, and have fun. I just, I think it, it could be really, really great for our town. So, I mean, obviously, it depends on how it's executed and we just need to plan and I don't want to... It's just a pile of money, right? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, yeah. can you... Yeah, for me, it's, I think it's great. It's just, it's so expensive, right? Mm -hmm. So, it's, yeah. But I, I think there really is an opportunity to work with the chamber. I mean, we talked about pairing it with something else. Make it its own thing, but add to it. I mean, yeah. you're bringing people in. Let's also get our businesses around right. it. I mean, we have all these events where we bring our businesses in. This is another one of those where it could be a great one or two days for them because uh, we're bringing thousands of people to normal. So, I mean, yeah, Boulder's been doing the Boulder Creek Festival for you know, yeah. the start of the summer every year for 40 <coughs> 50 years. And it's always been the kickstart to summer. There's a gazillion shops out there. You know, I, I fully in support of this, and I think we should really be thinking about it not as a one-time thing. It's like a five-year. Yeah. You know, if we want this to be successful, the first year is going to be, you know, it'll be interesting. The second year is going to be a little slow, and then it's going to have to just really start going. Um, but, you know, how do we defray the costs with the community? How do we, you know, how do we get the halo effect from this? Those are all things that I want to see, and I think this thing could be really cool as a way to kind of kickstart the summer and then roll into all the other events we have planned. I think it could be really neat to pair it with the Superior 5K that the Chamber puts on in, it's usually August, but 
we can see if it needs some stuff. This in August, I don't know if they would consider moving. Um, I'm thinking Fitness on the Rocks is a really popular festival. They typically have a Ninja Warrior course at Fitness on the Rocks, and it fits in really well there where that's one aspect. And then while, you're, while your kids are doing the Ninja course, you can be take, trying out a Zumba class or visiting with kickboxing or whatever else. And I think something like that would be really neat. And to Mark's point around identity, I, I think something around fitness would fit really well with the identity for Superior. And I mean, we're a pretty active town. I mean, the just a, a nominal head cost could defray a lot of you're talking five bucks a head, ten bucks a head. Right. I mean, you think about the amount of money you spend on on uh, entertainment for kids, and you know, for a couple of hours of, of entertainment, five or ten bucks is nothing. Yeah. Times a thousand it starts to become real money, and and then you get some sponsorship. We you know, we I I don't see us having to write a fifty thousand dollar check okay. for this. Okay. I I think if we I think we could. Uh, charge a little admission. I, I think to give it away, I, I don't know, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing more you know, pros and cons on that, but I think it's, uh, and maybe people would need to see it to really fully you know, uh, see the people. People are kind of cheap by nature, but once they see the value in something, then it's like, give me more, here's, you know, here's more money. And, uh, anyway. So we should also just take a little process as well. I mean, I think it's a great idea, but maybe kick it down to, not down, over to ProStock or somewhere for discussion. I mean, we want to be careful that we're not taking our, our our board good ideas and prioritizing them over the committee process. So maybe we figure out a way to engage Patrick in the committee process and, and get their thoughts, but I think it's a great idea. I think that's a great idea, Kevin, because ProStack has kind of reached to the point where there's not a whole lot of more parks to develop. Right. And one of the things, even when I was on there, is they were trying to start to grapple with how do we get involved in recreational types of activities as opposed to building parks. And so if we trip this over to ProStec and say, would you be interested in taking this on um, and getting their engagement, I think that's a that's a great way to Well, this is a wreck. It. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. You're right. They're actually kind of struggling with what I think that's a great way to get them engaged in a new and different way. Good. Okay. Cool. All right. I will, I'll reach out to Patrick, and then maybe the, after that, that dialogue, uh, we'll kick it down to, to ProStack. And we have a ProStack meeting on Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I can go to that. Okay. Speak to public comment. Right. No, we don't have an agenda yet, so you know, okay. you had, you had another. Yes. Okay. Um, so we all received an email yesterday, a Rocky Flats fracking petition. Um, while we were in this public forum, I wanted to bring it up. Um, so resident Dan Marcus um, was considering putting together a petition to encourage citizens to um, support Trustee Lasis's motion um, against oil and gas extraction at Rocky Flats. Um, his concern was that if he launches this petition and doesn't get enough support, that that would be used against the motion as, hey, there's not that many people in support, of it, which I understood his concern. Um, in, in talking with Dan, I, I thought it would be great if we, if we each individually on the board would be interested in encouraging support for this, talking to our neighbors, et cetera, um, but wanted to see how the board felt about that. My comment is, as a board, we have come out and supported Mark's, um, you know, we passed a resolution at the last meeting. If Dan wants to post that out there, I think it's it's totally up to each one of us whether we want to engage on that. That It's not a position that I think the board should make a statement on. You know, I think we can make people aware that it's there, mm -hmm. and then it's, um, an individual choice whether you want to go out and talk about it or not. I mean, you know, I have I have no qualms about doing it one way or the other, but I have to <coughs> commit to a private citizen that I'm going to go out and endorse it. That at this board level, um, I'm going to do it if I feel like it's the right thing to do. And I think it's 
it's great that you said that you were going to do it, but first of all, I haven't seen the petition. Um, and, you know, it's a calculated risk when you put something out there that it might not get response. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the way it is. And if Dan wants to do it, awesome. But I personally am not going to commit at this point one way or the other. You know, but I think it's great if he wants to do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, first off, it's Superior's motion. It's not my motion. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, motion. You made the motion. And then, I made the motion and then on behalf of Superior. This is our motion. Yeah. It's, not, it's not my motion. Um, no, we if, if named it, it your motion. If it fails, <laughs> it's my motion. If it succeeds, it's Superior's motion. Um, you know, I, I think uh, you know, Dan is a really valuable resident here, and you know, he was really active and engaged in doing a citizen-led survey and petition in connection with the whole Town 15 charter school uh, proposal, and you know, kind of. Um, you know, reached a, a whole bunch of community members and engaged with them in a way that, you know, was just really commendable. Um, and he reached people that we weren't reaching. Um, so, you know, my my general take is if, if we've got a resident who wants to do something and uh, advocate for something that they believe in, they should do so. And we should support it and encourage it. And but at, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's not our petition and you know, we're not directing it or anything like that. But, um, you know, I think it's nice that he's, he's asking for our thoughts and support. Um, but my general take on it is you, know, you spend some time putting this thing together and go for it. And, and I'm, not, I'm not concerned in any way, shape, or form, that anything that he's going to do is going to hurt our chances okay. with getting ultimately what we're going to bring to the June meeting of the Rocky Flat Stewardship Council. Um, all that's going to rise and fall based on you know the debate that we have, and you know. So I mean, I think getting additional citizen support behind it is great if we can get it. If, if not, I don't think that that's going to necessarily make the, the motion less likely to pass. Okay. I think that answers the question. Agreed. Thanks. Okay. Other others? My only one was, where are we on the, we just got to a meeting with, uh, I forget his name. Oh, Ryan? Ryan. Lefkowitz? Yeah. Yeah, I just got an email from him this week. And he's working on a schedule to come out. So um, I'm waiting to hear. I told him Mondays. Sorry, who was Ryan? He's with Avanti. He's the money, the money man. R.C. Superior. The money man. Yeah. Yeah. The one we had, so the yeah. previous board, <coughs> which you guys supposed to make sure this board is supportive, asked Mark and I to sort of have a meeting or two with Avanti to try to get Choose my words carefully. Try to get uh, some resolution around the, two, the ten million dollars. We clearly have a, a disagreement around a number of things. No point in going over that disagreement. I just sure. have memos about yeah. it. Um, but maybe there's some some equitable remedy that would be beneficial to both parties. And so we had a meeting where he heard directly what our position was from a business perspective, not a legal perspective. We heard his position, and we agreed to. Has some follow-ups, and a year later we've not had any. So, I'd like to get that on the books. Yeah, and you know, this kind of dovetails into having a, a conversation probably with Kendra about you know legal advice and strategy related to all of that. But um, at least based on what we heard to, during the concept plan on last Monday, um, you know if. Ranch is actually going to be you know, building what they're building. At least what Bill said, it sounded like they're going to be hitting that fifty million dollar threshold mm -hmm. in relative good. short order. So this may resolve itself by just circumstance. Um, you know, yep. 
independent of any additional kind of dialogue and changing documents and reaching future agreements, but I agree, it's, it's something that we should at least talk about. So I suppose to go further, it is, I mean, the 10 million is one topic, but a piece of that more specifically is an actual community amenity. Is that what you're hopefully getting to the end of as well? I mean, we saw a concept plan that didn't have a community amenity in it. There's conversations that need to be had about if and when, and I think that was Bill's comment. There's, guys, if you guys want this in there, let's talk about that. Well, the language is pretty squishy, right? And so it's, it's kind of the, the mutually agreed <coughs> community amenity, right? So, but yes, it is this, it's all, it would all be part of uh, some type of settlement discussion. I think if that were the case. And obviously no decision would be made in any meeting that the two of us room, but yeah. trying to figure out if there's, you know, if, if I think somebody owes me money personally, and it's been a few years since they paid me that money, I might take a discount on that money. Um, and so we'd like to have some conversations. We think they owe us the money. We know they owe us the money, to be clear. So in terms of next steps, we want to set a meeting around a meeting? I'd be flexible on, you know, I prefer Mondays, but yeah, yeah. I know he's coming in from Orlando. It's not yeah. easy to get from Orlando to here on a Monday, mm -hmm. right? So whatever. Okay. Just, Yeah, so we're, Martin and I are working to schedule uh, meetings with Adam from Better City, Big Mountain Development. Oh, yeah. Lauren met with him today. Ken's scheduled. Clint's scheduled. So he's out this week. So just email me. He's flexible on his times and days. Can you um, send us what time? Or can you just let us know? And then maybe we can just dovetail depending because I don't want to yeah, throw like we'll, nine meetings in front of them. We'll send, I'll send out okay. uh, when Clint and Ken are meeting okay. and, and then go from there. Yeah. And if we can't get them this week, we can always schedule something uh, a following week or week after. For the cool. For those that can't. Okay. He's, yeah, he's meeting in my office nine on Wednesday, and, and I've got facility to, I mean, we could either combine that meeting or if somebody wanted to do back-to-back. -back, right. And I can provide the conference Just room. No more than two. <laughs> right. And then Ken's at 1.30. On Wednesday? Mm. Uh, oh, wait, no. 10, 10, 10 o'clock on Thursday. Right. 10 o'clock on Thursday. Here at Town Hall. Yeah. I know Wednesdays are just tough here because of court. Yeah. Right. So I can provide space on Wednesday, any, really any time right. of the day, if if you want to come. I'm just in Upper Louisville. Okay. Mayor's office is in Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like our, chamber, it's like our no, no. chamber of commerce and, you know, a lot of our members. It's a little odd. I mean, people come over there. I would also note Adam isn't isn't very familiar with Superior yet, so I would encourage people to, if you're able, to meet with him somewhere in Superior, or I suggested he check out um, um, Old Town Louisville so he can get a sense of what that looks like. So if anybody's able to meet with him in an interesting location, I think that could be beneficial. My location's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, that's why I said it. Yours is perfect. It's a sea of office building. I, I actually Part talked to him quite a bit about your location for about 20 minutes yeah. today, so he'll probably okay. he'll let you know. All right. I think it is an interesting location. <laughs> Make sure he gets Mr. Folsom's list of restaurants and we can tell him to pick one of those. That's right. Sure. That's right. I need to share that with you. We don't get that. Get that. <laughs> I have one other, other that I would just like the board to consider. Five o'clock meetings are a crusher for me. And if there's any way we can schedule as many meetings as possible to start even at 5.30, that's a huge help for me. But it, it, you start at 1, it's a whole lot better for me than trying to do something at 5 o'clock because it's just, my schedule's kind of messy. So yeah. if, if we can yeah. try and work around that, that'd be great. Thank you. Or I'll be late, which is it. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Okay. We will adjourn. Thank you very much. Great discussion. Okay, and I was late, so can I now ask the question what happened about the Rocky Mountain fire?